I want to say hello to, to everyone. My name is Mateusz Fałkowski, and I am the deputy director of the Pileski Institute in Berlin. And this small conference on the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943 is the result of cooperation between the Pileski Institute in Berlin, the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, and the Turo University in Berlin. I would like to thank very much my colleagues uh, uh, at the Jewish Historical Institute and uh, Turo for this cooperation. And uh, I would say also some words, uh, first of all, about the Jewish Historical Institute. So this is a very special institution that emerged from the grassroots after the war and after the Shoah in an effort to preserve the memorial of the victims of the Holocaust, but also to save the memory of their collective action, agency, and resistance to show. And uh, if we lo are looking for some, something comparable, uh, it would be Vienna Library in London. So this is some, some sort of institution, some sort of uh, real history, real public history, social history, done by, 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 by people, directed also by values. And uh, it's in the collection of the Jewish Historical Institute that the, the so-called Ringenblum Archive is located. And it's also colleagues at the Jewish Historical Institute who are prominent experts in the area of ghetto uprising research. The Turo University is a younger institution, but also doing much uh, to understand the Holocaust and the agency of the persecuted Jews of occupied Europe. And this 18th anniversary in our seminar is also important because in uh, Western Europe, including Germany, all the time uh, until now, there is too little knowledge about what the occupation and the Shoah looked like in Eastern Europe. Uh, I will use some shorthand, but you will understand what I mean. Western interested audiences see the reality of the Holocaust more through the prism of the experiences, for, for example, the Jews in Amsterdam and Anne Frank diary than through the prism of the ghetto in Warsaw that was burned by the Germans and the actions of people like Emanuel Ringenblum and the Warsaw Ghetto Fighters. That is, it's about adding an important element to this picture. The second reason is of similar logic. All of us in the world of the 20, 21st century see in the first place the image of a terrible crime against defenseless victims. It's worth supplementing this in our heads with the image of subjectivity, causality, and agency of Jewish resistance. And the third important reason, uh, this is uh, some would can say that my personal reason, I am from Warsaw and the insurgents from both uprisings of 1943 and 1944 of Warsaw ghetto uprising and Warsaw uprising are particularly important to me. I am very much looking forward to the papers and the discussion, and I give the floor to, to Patrick Shostak, who will be our moderator. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Yes, um, I will lead us through today's um, meeting, which we all were very much looking forward to. Um, before, however, a little, very short additional notice. Um, yesterday we had a theater play also um, revolving around the theme of the 80th anniversary of the ghetto Warsaw, of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And part of that play were also lyrics and songs um, sung by Władysław Schlengel. And we thought it might be maybe a good idea to have him, in a way, participate today as well and weigh in from time to time. He's um, a Polish um, poet of um, Jewish origin. Um, as a famous critic put it, he was as Warsawian as it gets in the 20s and 30s. And he kept on writing also during the Second World War. 
and according to Emanuel Ringelblum, Schlengel's songs and poems enjoyed popularity and moved listeners to tears. Because they were up to date, they dealt with themes which were a part of the ghetto's daily life. And before we start with the official part of our gathering today, um, I would like to read a short uh, um, fragment, not the whole poem, of course, which he's written, entitled Two Deaths. Um, two Deaths, he was basically comparing the death of non-Jews during the Second World War and um, non-Jewish Poles, since this was his experience, and our, i.e. his death, so the Jewish death. Two Deaths. Your death and our death are two different deaths. Your death is a powerful death, jerking in quarters. Your death among gray fields of blood and sweat. Your death is a death from bullets, for something, for the fatherland. Our death is a stupid death, in the attic or in the cellar. Our death comes doggedly from behind a street corner as if meant nothing. Your death will be marked by the cross, the message lists it. Our death, a wholesale composition. They bury it and then goodbye. Your death face to face. You greet each other halfway. Our death, a hidden death. Kicked up in a mask of trepidation. Your death, an ordinary death, human and not very difficult. Our death, a trashy death, Jewish and nasty. Our death, your death, a poor, distant relative. When it meets your death, our death, certainly will not welcome it. So that was it. And with this, we can start with the official part. And um, the first presentation, um, which will be presented here uh, by Ms. Um, Agnieszka Żółkiewska. Um, Ms. Agnieszka um, Żółkiewska is a historian of literature, translator from Yiddish, a research worker of the Emanuel Ringelblum Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, of um, the importance of which we just heard from Mateusz, and um, she also won the Gerowski and Schmeruk Prize as a laureate. And uh, yeah, Ms. Żółkiewska, the microphone is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here with you. And um, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to share with you my knowledge, uh, my discoveries. <laughs> and uh, referring to um, uh, Władysław Schlengel, I can tell you that I just, uh, I've just discovered a new poem, a new, by him. Um, it was a coincidence. Uh, I found it in our archives, and I will publish it. Okay. Um, one, one could think that everything regarding the biggest Jewish cluster in the Nazi-occupied Europe that was the Warsaw Ghetto had already been said, but this is far from reality. The period from the January action to the April 1943 uprising is the part of the history of the Warsaw Ghetto that has not been fully examined yet. Although with such bare facts and numbers, it is hard to tell that story. It requires deeper thinking about social and psychological changes transpiring amongst ghetto prisoners, there is little doubt they were the changes that led to the creation of armed resistance and the uprising, which 80th anniversary we celebrate this year. I'm most interested in the personal aspect of the socio-psychological processes, and that is why today I shall try to show the last period of the Warsaw Ghetto's history from the viewpoint of its prisoners through their attitudes, beliefs, moods, and identity. 
The extermination action carried out in January 1943 was a turning point in the history of the Warsaw Ghetto. At that point, few people could believe the Nazi regime was actually planning to eradicate the Jewish people altogether. All delusions vanished at that moment. Um, through four days of the action, the Nazis deported approximately 5,000 people from the ghetto to Treblinka and killed about 1,000 on its streets. From that point onwards, the ghetto's residents lived in constant fright, in a state of ever-increasing panic. They realized the true intentions of the Nazi German authorities they understood they were planning another extermination action and they were not going to rest until they had accomplished the ultimate goal, the complete destruction of Jews. Halina. Oh, something. I can't manage. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's okay. Halina Birenbaum, reminiscence, I quote, uh, the Germans could bang on our home's doors any time and drag us all the way to Treblinka. We were expecting it more than anything else in the world. Subsequent events reinforced people's beliefs that their time was coming to an end and they were doomed to annihilation. At the end of February, by order of Himmler, most of the ghetto's factories working for the Wehrmacht were shut down and relocated to the forced labor camps in Poniatowa and Travniki. The Jews stopped working. They realized they were useless. They had lost das Lebenrecht, the right to life that was granted by the work for Nazi Germans. They did not want to volunteer to go to the labor camps in Poniatov and Travniki. They considered it as a ruse. Flyers spread all over the ghetto by the Jewish underground warned, Poniatovo and Travniki are Treblinka. Sensing the looming distraction, Jews would react in different ways and make different decisions. Some of them sought to flee the area. It was not so easy. Only those with enough money could pass to the other side of the wall. Those without were unable to purchase false documents needed to survive on the Aryan side. Insufficient money was also a hindrance when it came to hiding in the homes of Poles, who sometimes charge consider considerably fees for the service. It is no wonder, then, that certain Jews were ready to commit crimes to acquire money necessary to escape from the ghetto. Here I would like to present an example of a robbery of the Judenrat safe. It was carried out by the members of the Jewish uh, combat organization and uh, Marceli, uh, Marcel Reichranitsky, who was a Judenrat clerk at that time. For the assistance in planning the robbery, Reichranitsky was re rewarded by the organization with a share of the stolen money. He then used it by, uh, to buy his and his wife's freedom and in the end, salvation. He used it as a payment for the escape from the ghetto and for a hideout on the Aryan side. However, most of the Jews continued, they stay in the ghetto. Some of them search for other means of survival. At that point, the only available solution seemed to be hiding and waiting out the next action. For that reason, people started to desperately build all so sorts of shelters and bunkers, especially the underground. Such hideouts were being built even earlier, but the majority of them were constructed from the end of the January action to the start of uh, the April uprising. The poet Władysław Schlengel called this time in ghetto history the cave age. He wrote, people are returning underground. Indeed, the Jews built a second underground ghetto for themselves. Construction works 
would take place mostly at night, shelters and bunkers capable of sustaining people until the end of the war would rise at that time. Some could fit from 50 to 300 people in them. The best ones were equipped with ventilation, water pumps, and electric lights. People who prepared safe places, bunkers or shelters for themselves, were a minority in the ghetto. They were wealthy people who had enough resources to finance such operations. Uh, so what became of the other citizens who had no way of securing, securing themselves in case of another extermination action? Many of them, if not most, plunged into feeling of powerlessness and desperation. They had completely given up, having no faith in possi uh, possible salvation. There was no way to lift these people's spirits. Utterly bereft of hope, faith, and courage, they lived like convicts awaiting their execution. The most desperate group was the youth lone girls and boys who had lost everyone close to them. They possessed no money or friends to get them out of the ghetto. They were doomed to whatever fate had in store for them. This common misfortune united them, created a sort of bond between them. They would gather every day to collectively drown out the fear and pain, move their thoughts away from their tragedy, their hopeless situation. These despairing, despondent young people found the only substance of their life in alcohol. They would drink very much to stun themselves and forget. Another way to distraction was sex. But none of these amusements could bring them any solace. The imminent doom was ever present in their minds. A witness testimony claims that even after consuming significant amounts of uh, alcohol, they would repeat over and over again, I quote, we will die, we will perish anyway. Few testimonies mention uh, the atmosphere of depression and despair amongst the uh, ghetto's young Jews. It is taboo to this day. A rare exception can be found in the memories of a Jewish woman who was a young, barely adult girl at that time. Here is a piece, I quote. People among us kept getting more and more drunk. Boys would come. Uh, over to us every morning, and the girls would join soon after with several bottles of vodka. That's how our day would always start. We would get drunk for it to pass quicker, and for us not to think about what was and what would come next. The same woman writes of drunken, mad, raving boys repeating the lyrics of a song over and over again. I quote, hang me, hold me, kiss me, maybe for the last time. The ghetto also held uh, those youngsters who would grow in numbers with each passing day that were not acting like they had accepted their fate. Their desire for vengeance was more powerful than the fear of annihilation. They decided to defend themselves until the last drop of blood. They intended to die with honor, not like, I quote, animals being led to slaughter, but like soldiers fighting on a battlefield. These young men were perfectly aware of the inevitable failure. Even one of the most known leaders of uprising, Mordechai Anielewicz, uh, knew and in an equal fight, awaited them a struggle without a ray of hope. Emanuel Ringelblum wrote that Anilevich, I quote, suspect, suspected the destruction of the ghetto. He was convinced neither him nor his fighters would survive its liquidation, that they would die like homeless dogs and nobody would even know the place of the eternal rest. 
As we know, the words of Anielewicz would be fulfilled completely. He died alongside other fighters a couple weeks after the start of the uprising in the bunker at Mila Street. There is no time to elaborate on the preparations to the uprising. It is a separate topic. I would only like to address a certain vital matter, namely the fact that the ghetto uprising would not have come to pass had the Jews not changed their attitude towards the issue of armed resistance. Since the first extermination action in summer 1942, people thought of using arms against the Nazi Germans as an act of stupid heroism that could bring about major casualties. There was a widespread fear of Nazi vengeance and the awesome threat of collective responsibility. This negative attitude only changed upon the first Jewish military revolt in the ghetto in January 1943. According to Bernard Mark, 20 Germans and Polish policemen died and around 50 more got injured. Due to these events, the Jews believed that armed resistance made sense regardless of human casualties due to its ability to slow the action down, increasing the chances of saving a number of people. Since, since uh, the, the events of January 1943, the influence of a Jewish combat organization kept on growing in the ghetto because of, as Emanuel Ringelblum writes, it had the power to earn society's obedience to prop by propaganda and ballots. People were very impressed by its death sentences performed on Jewish spies and informers. It is worth remembering that such actions were also initiated by the Jewish Military Union, the second military organization in the Warsaw Ghetto. The last matter I would like to discuss is the problem of identity. Uh, the awareness of impending catastrophe brought the people trapped inside the ghetto even closer together to the point it created a unique sort of bond between them. I've talked about this in connection to the Jewish youth, but it appears that the phenomenon was more common. Even those Jews who had fled the ghetto did not entirely cut ties with it. Some would visit the place to meet their relatives or friends there. Religious identity was also strong amongst the Jews, Jews in the ghetto. Despite the tense situation, in April 1943, they were preparing to the upcoming Passover. Some houses stored matzah, wine, and even eggs inside them. Paula Rothschild mentions that there was a lack of festive dishes to prepare seder. The issue was solved by bringing dishes from the houses of people deported to Treblinka. In contrast, we have Helena Hufeisen Schuppe writing in her testimony that a Jewish woman hiding on the Aryan side gave her sister trapped in the ghetto a piece of fresh meat for seder. When on the 19th of April, the day before Passover, the uh, extermination action began in the ghetto. Some people hidden in their shelters and bankers tried to adhere to festival rituals, praying. I have shown you, in short, the final chapter of the story of the Warsaw Ghetto, the story of its prisoners. These people saw their death coming. They did not want to die in Treblinka. They perfect, perfectly realized how Jews were murdered there. The ghetto would receive terrifying news about the topic mostly delivered by Jewish escapees from the death camp. It can be then assumed with high certainty that they were doomed to resist. Some chose civil resistance, creating safe houses for themselves other opted for armed resistance preparing for the uprising. However, regardless of how hard they tried to stay alive, building safe hideouts for them, 
Regardless of the effort they put into preparing for the uprising, the last days of their lives were filled with fear of the impending doom. Today we are not able to imagine what these people felt back then. Władysław Schlengel compared them to anxious animals sensing a forest fire in the air. They suspected the ghetto would become their tomb, but they did not know they would be gassed, burned, and buried alive. For that was the fair terrifying death the Nazi Germans gave them. Today, after 80 years have passed since those events, we must still keep remaining everyone that these people died many, after many months of heroic and hopeless struggle to survive. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was the last stage of the struggle. The death matters. Thank you. Thank you very much for this premier, very interesting presentation. And um, yeah, we go on with our schedule. Um, we have our next participant join online. And um, it will be a presentation about the Ringelblum archive, its creation, phenomenon, and post-war history. Uh, delivered by Justyna Majewska, historian of literature, translator from Yiddish, and research worker at the Immanuel Ringelblum Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. So um, I guess we shall begin very soon. Um, hello, Ms. Majewska, I hope you can hear us. In hello, works. yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, everything works okay. brilliantly. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one uh, one thing. I'm not um, uh, literature historian. I'm I'm cultural studies. I, I graduate cultural studies and I'm sociologist. So, uh, but that's not really important at this moment. I will share my screen with you. Um, yeah. I think it's working now. All right. So, um, thank you very much for kind introduction and for letting me join you online. Uh, today I will talk about the Ringlum Archive, a creation uh, created in the Warsaw Ghetto and stored in the Jewish Historical Institute. I would like to talk how the archive was created, about the principles and aims, as well as how it was researched after the war. So let me start with a brief summary of how the archive was created and what principles organized the work. Uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Archive was launched on November 22, 1940, uh, simultaneously to closing uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto. It worked under code name Oynek Shabbos, which in Yiddish uh, means the joy of Sabbath. Uh, its aim was to bear the witness, to write down the daily events of the war as accurate as possible, while maintaining as many perspectives as possible. Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum, who created the archive and after whom the archive is named, was a historian by, the, by education, a teacher by profession and a social activist by passion. He was born in Buczacz, the same town where uh, Simon Wiesenthal, uh, the historian and uh, writer Shmuel Josef Agon were born and raised. Ideologically and politically, Ringelblum was associated with the Jewish left-wing movement from a very young age. Membership in Poale Zion left shaped his uh, socialist uh, philosophy, sensitive to all kinds of injustice, and a sense that the Jewish culture, and language in particular, should be subject of academic research. All his uh, subsequent activities were rooted in this experience. After graduating history at Warsaw University in 1922, where he earned his PhD in history, he became history teacher, 
uh, at a Hebrew language middle school uh, for girls. Uh, at the same time, he was active in a number of academic institutions, uh, especially the YIVO, Institute for Jewish uh, Research in Vilna, as well as a number of welfare organizations. During this time, he had made many uh, contacts that would uh, prove crucial for the work of the Oynek Shabbat. In the autumn of 1938, he organized aid for the thousands of Jews deported from German to Zbonsze in Poland. And this experience prepared him in organizational terms uh, for the uh, immediate um, <clears throat> impending catastrophe. When the war broke out, Emanuel Ringelblum was in Geneva, uh, driven by a sense of civil duty and also concerned by, by his family, for his family, he immediately returned to Poland. He joined the relief effort for Jews, whose financial, healthcare and housing situation grew worse day by day. He cooperated with the American Jewish uh, Jewish Joint uh, Distribution Committee, so-called JOINT, uh, a Jewish relief organization based in New York, and later joined the uh, management of the Jewish social self-help. Uh, now, let's go back to the Warsaw Ghetto Archive. Who was uh, the people behind it apart from the Ringelblum? Uh, so uh, we estimate that it was about 60 people, of whom we know about 30, uh, 36 by their names, who were involved in gathering documents. If we look at the Oynek Shabbos uh, via its associates, we will see uh, the world uh, of Jewish, of Polish Jews in miniature. Archive associates uh, had different political views, different approaches to Jewish languages and religion, education, have different social position, economic status, uh, age, gender, place of birth, uh, but they were all united by the feeling that they were witnessing and uh, they are participating in unpre unprecedented event that should be documented. Ringelblum documenting meant collecting not only uh, the factual information, but also documenting traces of dramatic social changes under anti-Semitic uh, regulations and laws. laws. Uh, Oynek Shabbos, uh, direct methodological, methodological background uh, should be looked in the circle of the historians of Ivo, uh, which I already mentioned, especially uh, Shimon Dubunov, who postulated that research and documentation of Jewish history should be based not only on the official and personal documents of the Jewish elites, but also on accounts of so-called simple or ordinary Jews. Um, and following uh, these research methods developed in Evo before the war, the archive gathered data concerning various social groups uh, of the ghetto, like women, intellectuals, children, Jewish police, youth, religious Jews, people suffered from starvation, as well as hairdresser uh, or refugees, to name only a few. Uh, they collected documents of social also called everyday life so they collected private notes and diaries written in the ghetto literary works lyrics of songs sung by the beggars in the streets of the ghetto letters leaflets underground press accounts of displayed person and escapees from the camps announcement of the jewish council minutes of meetings of various organizations id cards advertisement forms uh, prescriptions letterhead Tram tickets, armbands with the Star of David, um, invitations to cultural event, uh, wraps for candies and other products that were manufactured in the ghetto. And we can list more and more and more. A certain part of the documents were inspired by the archive, like professional studies of uh, social, economical and demographic issues. Uh, they were commissioned, uh, interviews were conducted, drafts of uh, scientific papers and theses were prepared uh, with a view to their more detailed study after the war. And now I'll show you just a few examples of the documents that we have today in the archive. Uh, so you can see a postcard and invitation um, invitation for the uh, concert. 
then you can see uh, instructions uh, how to knock to the door to go to a particular person who is living in uh, uh, in a flat in the ghetto uh, where there is really plenty of tenants, uh, drawings uh, that are gathered in the Warsaw ghetto, ration, ration card, the uh, Melda Carta. Now you can see um, photographs of two escapees, one from the Helno death camp and the, and the other one is from the Treblinka death camp. Both of these photographs are in the ghetto with the uh, inscriptions. Uh, now the example of a diary written in the Warsaw ghetto, this particular one is by Abraham Levin and next to it is the... Um, uh, Bekal Makung about the uh, starting the Great Deportation in July 1942. Um, so Ringelblum and his closest uh, workers envisioned that the final outcome of the archive would be book entitled Two and a Half Years of the War uh, that were never fully accomplished uh, as the researchers' work were suddenly interrupted with the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto that started on the 22nd July 1942. Uh, within following months, um, thousands of Jews were taken and murdered in the Treblinka death camp, including many people associated with the Oynek Shabbos. In the face of the immediate danger, in August 1942, the first part of the archive was hidden uh, in the metal boxes, and the second part was hidden probably in February 1943 in the two um, milk cans. <clears throat> the people perished, but the day of work survived, and after the war, three survivors of the Oynik Shabbat, Rahela Auerbach, uh, Bluma and Herzwasser, rushed not without obstacles to find the hidden documents. At that time, after the war, Warsaw was a sea of rubbles. You can see uh, this very well on this picture. This is the area of the former Warsaw ghetto. Tracks of the street were barely visible and search for the archive required both money and manpower. In the city of ruins where people didn't have place to live, they didn't have water, they didn't have uh, enough food and clothes, the task of finding the documents apart from small group of survivors, seems to be not so important. Nevertheless, they managed to get public interest and resources for the task. And documents, some of them badly damaged, were recovered uh, in the September 1946 and in December uh, 1950 from the ruins of the uh, Berborohov School at uh, Novolitki Street. The, now you can see the drawing showing the plan of searching the basement of the ruins of the tenants' house at Świętojerska Street. Uh, you can see uh, that each box, uh, which supposed to be each uh, basement in the building uh, is been searched and um, signed by the people who are looking for the documents at this particular area. Um, so, as I said, the documents were uh, discovered again, and this is uh, uh, photos from the footage of the actual taking uh, the boxes from the uh, cellar. Here you can see Rahela Auerbach and uh, Herr Wasser opening the boxes on the spot uh, on September 18th uh, after they were uh, discovered. Uh, the first attempt to, uh, and of course, when they were discovered, they, are, they were immediately uh, researched, and the first attempt to register the rescued fragments of the archive was undertaken immediately after its excavation. On September 23, 1946, the first two boxes were opened by the Historical Commission and a list of documents was uh, compiled and entitled Catalogue of Dr. Emanuel Ringelbrum Archive. And that was made by, uh, written by Dr. Laura Einhorn. Um, immediately Absolutely, immediately it was uh, known that the Ringelblum Archive uh, form, will form the foundation of all works on Jewish life occupied Poland and the team working on the archive had on the beginning the idea to publish as soon as possible all the documents. In, uh, in a document entitled uh, Documents from the Ringelblum Archive uh, Submitted for Publication, 
the Jewish press agency noted that, and I quote, the Central Jewish Historical Commission, which studies documents of German crimes against the Jews, had begun the conservation of documents and material contained in partly unearthed archive of Dr. Of Dr. Ringelblum, which have undergone significant destruction. The Preservation Department of the Central Committee of Jews in Poland has photographed the materials and uh, they are uh, now ready for publication. All publishing projects of the Central Jewish Historical Commission will be suspended until the end of work of the first volume of documents from Dr. Rigum archive, end of quote. Um, during the years of the existence, the, the first years of the existence, the Central Jewish Historical Commission had published nearly 24 books in Polish and Yiddish. And that was really good uh, fortune uh, for the publication of the Rulum Archive. But in the meantime, uh, the poly oh, this is the, um, the 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 photograph of the uh, the first page of the first catalog, just so you can see how it looked like. Uh, so mm, the political situation changed, and this and so the plans of the Jewish Central Jewish Historical Commission. In October 1947, the Central Jewish Historical Commission was uh, reconstituted as the Jewish Historical Institute, and all the publishing projects indicated by the commission were suspended. And now, as there is no much time, I will just focus on on the history of publishing of the Enemalwer Lingelbrum Morsogero uh, notes. Um, since the uh, Lingelbrum notes were under under uh, in 1946, it took the editors few years to get them ready uh, for publication. That was due to a few reasons. First of all, uh, the bad condition of the paper. Secondly, bad handwriting of the author uh, and the need to uh, crack the codes that Ringelblum were using in his notes. At least five people were engaged to, to decipher the manuscript, including Hersch and Bluma Wasser, the former activist of the Ringelblum archive, Josef Kernisch, Isaac Trank, and the first editor, uh, Nathan Blumenfeld. The first issues uh, of the Blätter für Geschichte that you can see uh, on the screen, uh, the Jewish Historical Institute Academic Journal that was published in Polish and in Yiddish, um, so in the, in the first number, the first, first issue of this journal, uh, they have published about 50 page long parts of Ringelblum uh, writings from 1941-1942. Uh, it was uh, accompanied by, by a rather short entry uh, providing technical information and very short uh, footnotes. Uh, three years later, in 1941, Polish translation of Ringelblum notes from 1940 was published in the Bulletin Żydowskiego Instytutu Historycznego. So that was mirror um, academic journal to the Blätter für Geschichte. Uh, the academic apparatus what was uh, much more extensive this time. The editors also admitted that due to the uh, difficulty of reading the text, many omissions had been made, and the first full Jewish edition of Ringelbrum notes was published no earlier than 1952. We know it was prepared and uh, received by the readers from the, uh, how it was prepared and received by the readers from the research by Professor Joanna Nalawajko Kulikov, who in 2018 published the newest and the fullest scholar edition of the Ringelbrum notes. So in the introduction, the collegium of the editors uh, state that they have made no changes including the grammar, orthographic mistakes, and the <clears throat> uh, imitations in the text are caused uh, by the uh, by uh, lack of readability of the manuscript and it damages. In 1952 edition uh, was widely criticized uh, by the former members of the Historical Commission, Blumenthal and Kermisch, um, who were early engaged in preparing the edition and now I mean, in 1942, uh, they were in Israel and New York, New York, respectively. Blumenthal has exposed the omissions in full edition, uh, and he said they were already, 
the parts that were omitted were already published in the Blätter Fahrgeschichte and in Bulletin Żydowskiego Zupu Historycznego. Kermisch, in more systematic review, uh, printed out that uh, the censorship has uh, erased all parts of Ringelblum notes that uh, regarded uh, Polish-Jewish relations, uh, Jews converts, political issues, religion issues, comments on Polish and Jewish underground activities, and so on. What Kermisch was particularly disappointed with was a distortion of the Polish-Jewish relations. He stated that the readers were given a one-side view on the Warsaw Ghetto and reads only about good Poles. After the thaw in 1957, a Jewish Historical Institute started to cooperate with academic institutions outside Poland on 20th anniversary of Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1962 and in 1963, Jewish Historical Institute published uh, in Yiddish two volumes of the Ringelblum archive. Um, of, of the Ringelblum, sorry, writings. Um, the introduction was written by historian Dr. Pro, uh, Arthur Eisenbach, uh, who, apart from biography of the Ringelblum, um, description of the work on the Oynek Shabbat admitted also that the previous edition wasn't really uh, the full uh, in their fullness. Uh, Arthur Eisenbach uh, was the first historian who conducted really extensive research on the methods of work of the Oynek Shabbat. He was Ringelsblum pre-war collaborator and brother-in-law. Uh, his articles even though uh, subjected to the censorship, often uh, un uh, offered an in-depth examination and for a long time unparalleled insight into the everyday uh, workings of the archive based to a large extent of Ringelblum notes. So together with the notes from the ghetto, editors published also a Ringelblum essay written while he was in hiding. Uh, and the essay was on Polish-Jewish relations during the war. It was originally written in Polish, and the translation was made by uh, Bernard Mark, at that time the director of the Jewish Historical Institute. At the same time, uh, the same team was preparing the edition, Polish edition of Ringelbrum uh, Notes. It was supposed to be published by Czytelnik Printing House. Uh, the book was ready and passed to the printing house already in 1961. It was supposed to be released in 1963, but did not happen until 1983. As Joanna Nalwajko Kulikov writes, the initial delays were due to negative uh, uh, negotiations between editors and Czytelnik regarding the essay on Polish-Jewish relationships, and finally, during the anti-Semitic campaign of 1967-68, the title was withdrawn from the publication. So um, next edition was from 1983, uh, I mean the Polish edition from 1983, edited by the uh, Artur Eisenbach. Uh, for years were a, was a canon edition used by Holocaust scholar and shaping their understanding of Jewish experience of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, and that was until uh, Joanna Nalwajko Kulikov, five years ago now, uh, published the new Polish edition. Uh, and now let's go to the uh, to the edition I mentioned a few times. In 1990s, a Jewish Historical Institute started a project of full academic edition of the Regulum Archive. Professor Felix Stich, a former director of Jewish Historical Institute, and the editorial team have been debating how the edition should be uh, proceed. Uh, at that time, Professor Tich was an advocate of chronological approach, uh, so all the documents would be published in the order of the republication. But finally, uh, it was decided to edit the archive via collections, and the first volume presented uh, all letters uh, informing about the Holocaust uh, that reached Warsaw Ghetto. Next volume was on faith of children, next on what happened at Kresy, and so on and so on. This year, uh, Jewish Historical Institute uh, will complete the edition with publishing uh, 36th in the series volume uh, devoted to the underground press of the Hoshamer Hatzair, 
And I have to say that that would never happen if not for the Eleonora Bergman, uh, Tadeusz Epstein and Katarzyna Persson, who is with you today. Um, and of course, late Professor Paweł Śpiewak uh, and the army of scholars and translators who uh, give their time and their intellectual efforts uh, to prepare the edition. Uh, and Zich not only provides scholar edition of the Rugum archive, but also share its this treasure, its treasure via internet. So everyone who is interested can can see high uh, resolution scans of the documents from the archive at the Central Jewish Library, and the address is cbj.jhi.pl. Uh, you are all most welcome to go to the page and explore the collection via scans, but also via um, available uh, volumes uh, in Polish and uh, some of them already in English. And with this sentence, I will uh, finish my talk for now. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, great. Um, yes, um, great thank you for Ms. Majewska for um, providing us with an in-depth perspective on both the history and the essence of the Ringelblum archive. And um, for the next presentation, um, we will actually learn about the position of the Ringelblum archive within contemporary Holocaust research, an assessment of the state of the field delivered by another very prominent representative of the Jewish Historical Institute, Ms. Katarzyna Persson, historian of Eastern European Jewish history and the head of the academic research department at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. And uh, yeah, if I may just ask you to come at the front and um, show us what the contemporary research looks like. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my uh, presentation will be a bit of a uh, on a bit of a uh, crossover between the first two ones. So I'll um, talk about uh, the heroic aspect of the Ringo archive in a way in which it shows heroism, or rather anti-heroism, and also uh, the way in which this heroic aspect of the archive shows us uh, what is still to be research and spaces, empty space which we still have in, uh, in research on, uh, on the Warsaw Ghetto. Good. Great. Um, the Ringel Markive, which you had just so wonderfully presented by uh, Dr. Justyna Majewska, is uh, very rightly so often told as uh, the story of the triumph of humanity. It's a story of, young, of people who are in unbearable material and mental conditions strive to grasp and document the whole complexity of the world surrounding them as they're trying to understand the mechanisms of Nazi policies and their own fate. Creating the archive is often described as a struggle for human dignity and communal honor and a prime example of spiritual and cultural resistance carried out in the Warsaw Ghetto. Yet what I'd like to show today is uh, something completely different. So the purposefully anti-heroic aspect of the archive. Using the research methods of, of the Jewish Research Institute of EVO, as um, Justyna shows, members of the archival team documented or attempted to document as completely as possible the Jewish experience during the war. And one of the key principles of EVO was doing of history. So engaging whole communities in the effort of collecting historical sources for local Jewish history and encouraging, and I quote here Samuel Kassov, encouraging ordinary Jews to believe that their lives were worth studying. And one of the results of such an undertaking was to undermine the past idealized concept of unified Jewish people united by their religion and suffering. So as Oynek Shabbos founder, Emanuel Ringelblum very famously said, they sought to, uh, to search for the truth on the ghetto community, however bitter and however difficult it would be. So when choosing which memories to put into a time capsule, that became the Ringelm archive, the archivists were not only looking for the heroic ones. And of course, there are plenty of heroic ones. 
There are those of the young underground fighters, of messengers, of health workers, of teenage carers, of teachers, and numerous, numerous, numerous others. They are, of course, also part of the archive, but our history, quote unquote. So the history of Jewish suffering, written by Jews and aimed uh, as a source material for future Jewish historians as conceptualized by Ringham Archive, included among, quote unquote, us, also smugglers, sex workers, Jewish policemen, and Gestapo collaborators. It is their memory that was also saved from erasing and that was preserved for future generations, and their memory that was purposefully uh, kept to shape how the also ghetto community would be remembered. So the choices which they took, the choices which for many years after the war were considered to be quote unquote difficult, were not only described to evaluate them morally and document them as a way of condemning them, though that too. They were also, I would claim, or rather mainly, uh, providing an alternative narrative to Nazi propaganda. So, for example, when in a Nazi propaganda film from the Warsaw Ghetto, we see a Jewish policeman, a beggar dying in front of a cafe, and a smuggler walking next to them in shiny boots, in the Ringel archive, all of these people are not silent anymore. They're actually allowed to speak for themselves, they're given a voice, and they're allowed to tell their own story of the Warsaw Ghetto. So one of the key concepts underpinning the Ringel archive is that this is no longer, of course, a history written by a victor. And not only in a sense that uh, it's created by people who are all, as we know now, victims of the Holocaust. Already during the creation of the archive, it was purposefully reaching out to people whose, uh, uh, whose memory would otherwise have been erased. So people from among the 100,000 who were uh, murdered, who died in the Warsaw Ghetto of hunger and illnesses even before. The, uh, before the deportation action uh, from 1942. This uh, breath of voices, including the also in the archives, was apparent and what was planned to be the key research project of the, of the archive, what Justyna Majewska described already, so the two and a half year project. And the work on the two and a half year project, so the f first comprehensive history of the Warsaw Ghetto, went only for a few months. It was uh, disturbed both by, by the beginning of Axel Reinhardt and then by the deportations in the summer of 42. And we have very little material that actually came out of this, uh, of this project other than outlines for larger essays. But one of the topics that we do have is, uh, it seems fairly completed, is the study of Jewish women's experience during the war. The first outline of this topic was prepared by Emanuel Ringelum himself already in mid-1941. And this uh, outline opens with a paragraph, and I quote, heroism of the Jewish woman. Can one speak of heroism of the Jewish woman? If so, in what is it expressed? Heroism of the Jewish woman as replacement for the husband in the early phase of the occupation. Heroism of the Jewish woman sending her child out to smuggle because of hunger. Quiet heroism of the woman at home in times of privation and hunger. While Ringelblum also covered in his outline the dynamics of family life, religious life, gender-specific violence, including sexual violence, and women's participation in trade and smuggling, it is clear that his focus in this, in this uh, outline is on the domestic, on the family, and very clearly it reflects uh, his larger tendency, which is very clear in his notes, to present women in a heroic light. However, in the end, and that's why women are portrayed completely differently. It wasn't Ringelblum who carried out the task of actually writing about Jewish women. And uh, in, in line with archives principles, this part was handed over to a woman, Cecilia Sopakova. And Cecilia Sopakova was born in 1902 in Brzezlitewski, so she was 40 years old in 1942 when the, when the project was carried out. She completed uh, uh, first the Polish language Jewish high school in Warsaw, then she began studying history uh, her studies were interrupted by her uh, progressive problems with eyesight. But she was a prominent person in Jewish intellectual life of uh, interwar Warsaw. She, had, uh, she held literary meetings for the top of, of Jewish uh, intelligentsia in interwar Warsaw. And very, she was also, very importantly, very much a, uh, accomplished professionally in her own right. She was a translator of Dubnov, whom uh, she translated Dubnov's Jewish history with uh, Sofia Dubnov-Ehrlich. 
she wrote extensively about Dubnov and, and Jewish newspapers, and clearly was was his personal uh, was his uh, had a personal acquaintance with him and a very close relationship. And she was also a prolific publicist, publishing in daily press mainly about issues related to childhood development, education, social inequality, and women's status in society. So in this sense, she was a perfect choice for a, uh, for a two and a half year project. She was someone who very easily crossed cultural boundaries that marked pre-war Jewish Warsaw, as Samuel Castle wrote. Uh, as was the case with other, Jew, uh, other collaborators of Ringelblum, we know very little about her life in the ghetto. We do know that she died in the first action together with her daughter. But what was left from her is, uh, is, her, uh, is the two and a half year project, for, for the two and a half year project is the study of Jewish women in the ghetto. 17 interviews with Jewish women coming from all, uh, all walks of life, among them women who are relatively well off, women who are dying of hunger, also natives with very strong support networks, women who are refugees and deportees and have, uh, who live in disease-ridden shelters, women who are highly educated, women have no education. Uh, she's, I assume most of you are familiar with that, with that text. It's published both in English and in Polish, now in a full edition of the Ringelm Archive, and it's undoubtedly one of the most important texts relating to social history of, uh, uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, and the key element of it, which, because I'll ask you the description of it, is, is that uh, there is, uh, they are interviews with women. They are only described by the first, uh, first letter, uh, of their name, and they do indeed have very, very different life stories. Uh, it's very clear that uh, Swapakova's study, following again uh, work of Evo, is a prime example of microhistorical approach. This allows her to reflect on both plurality and variety of voices and to demonstrate the complexity of ghetto life. And this diversity is, of course, the testimony to plurality of worldview existing in a Jewish community, which Agnieszka Żółkiewska spoke about, but as well as the diversity and experiences of fates in the ghetto. Importantly, and that's again something that's very clear in work of the archive on the whole, while description of women's experiences begin at the outbreak of the war, Swapakova also provides the reader with an extensive backstory of her interviewees. And this part of the interview is important both for her and for the person she's talking about. For Swapakova, because it gives her context for the wartime actions, for the women themselves, because they are given an opportunity to speak of their lives before they became the mass or impoverished mass of, of, of ghetto inhabitants. So she shows how women past affects the choices in the ghetto and how, how they fit within the new social structure uh, of ghetto life. As she writes, the Jewish woman has penetrated almost all spheres of life. In some spheres, she has hegemony over the man, having become a structural factor in the shaping of our new reality, both economic and moral. She incorporates many models from her past experience into her personal social activity, but she adjusts her experience to the new commands of life with subtle and often surprising intuition. An important part of her study is also the focus on the future, so she's emphasizing the woman's power and tenacity in the ghetto, and uh, very clearly shows that this could le lead to the rethinking of women's role uh, in, in post-war uh, post world. While women in Swabakova's study take over male roles, almost all of the women she speaks of become the key breadwinner for the family, gender still remains a key element of their experience. They must look after the children, they fall pregnant, they are subjected to gender-specific violence. At the same time, less in danger than men outside the ghetto, they venture more outside of it, providing for families by carrying out various types of, uh, of trade and smuggling. So Pakova's protagonists are not just victims, they are by all means possessive of agency. She notes uh, in, her, in her work, and that's probably one of the key, uh, key sentences of the, uh, of the text, is that the will for life not only doesn't wane in the face of adversity, but quite contrary, explodes with a defensive reaction. They keep fighting because their will for life prevails. Yet, as she clearly implies, not everybody has the same kind of agency. The agency of, of these women depends on their individual position in the internal hierarchy of, the, of ghetto life. Moreover, the limits of one's agency constantly change as power constellation in the ghetto change. 
So this recognition of fundamentally incoherent and fluctuating nature of ghetto experience is undoubtedly one of the key qualities of her study. As she writes in a study of Mrs. F, who's a young smuggler, Mrs. F got used to sharp zigzags in her daily experience with a kind of fatalistic acceptance. She developed a philosophical approach to life typical for many Jewish women today. She claims everything I have to bear is necessarily evil. I have to survive. After the war, after the war I will make up for my losses. Mrs. F faced all the adversities standing in her way of her survival with courage. Not all voices contained in this study are easy to. She also talks about women who are on the verge of, of death of starvation. She talks extensively about one woman, Mrs. G, whose study, whose history is probably the best known of all of these and most uh, present in scholarship, Ms. G, who is a, a waitress and then becomes a sex worker in the ghetto. Yet Swapakova very clearly refrains from judging and does not give her readers any space to judge anyone by pre-war moral standards. Instead, she shows many complex overlapping factors that influence people's choices and their self-perception get alive. In Swapakova's study, women's actions are not heroic in a way that Ringelblum saw them as heroic, so they're not fulfilling a high purpose or attaining a noble end. On the contrary, their actions are the only answer to an inhumane situation of the ghetto, a situation which must be taken in all of its complexity, complexity if it's ever to be understood. Of course, Sopakova's study is not perfect, and it very clearly also shows, uh, in, a, in some ways, uh, uh, her, uh, there's, for example, there's no, uh, uh, no, uh, there's very little sp uh, said about uh, the new elite of the ghetto. There's few women who are in any way linked to the new authorities in the ghetto or to the Jewish police. Something that's very, very present in Ringel Markov in other documents. Uh, there's very little about ideological and political conflicts in the ghetto. Again, something that's very clear, clearly, uh, clearly present in uh, Ringel Bloom's uh, documents. There's also very little, and in this here, she actually mirrors the archive and its, uh, uh, and its uh, blank holes, is uh, the issue of religiously observant women. Even though they constitute the majority of women in pre Warsaw and in the ghetto, there's not one religiously observant woman in, uh, in her study. Their experience is present in the archive, but only in one study, which is written by uh, Shimon Huberband, entitled Telling Me the Moral Decline of the Jewish Woman During the War. But that study is very clearly written from a perspective of an orthodox man. So um, in this sense, the only experience of religious woman is shown through the eyes of, uh, of a religious man, not a woman. This omission clearly demonstrates that even an archive so immense and so purposefully striving for reflecting complexity of Jewish life in Poland could never give full justice to the myriad of voices of the last, lost temporary community of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. And I would just like to end by saying that it's absences like this that brings us closer to awareness of the enormity of destruction of the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another very interesting presentation. And now it's the time for us to, so to speak, turn the tide. And uh, we would like to ask our participants to just take a seat here. And uh, for you, dear audience, to have you participate and contribute during our Q&A session, um, which is meant to take place around 30 minutes. And after that, there will be a break. So, um, I also think that uh, Ms. Majewska should be in the background. Marek? Is it? Yes. Okay. So, who would like to start? So, thank you for these uh, wonderful presentations. Um, I actually have two questions. My, my first uh, question goes to Justina Majewska. Can you tell us something about the, the print runs of the, the Ringelblum uh, editions you, you mentioned? So not, I mean, Ringelblum's diary, um, the Jewish, uh, the Yiddish, um, the, the, the Yiddish uh, publications, and then the first Polish uh, by Chitelnik, which you said was in 1983 or so. Can you give us any idea about the print run? 
Uh, and then my second question uh, uh, to Kasia Persson. Um, you introduced this, this uh, fascinating study on, on, on women in the ghetto. Uh, does this study also elaborate on the changing rule of mothers? That means, I mean, she, she told us that, well, she's fighting for her kids and so on. Um, but we also know that in some parts, the, the kids actually became the breadwinners for the family. So is that also reflected there? Okay. Maybe we start with uh, thank you very much for the question. I will try to answer it as um, as much as I can. So, um, when they decided to publish the Wrinkled Room uh, notes, first they uh, just published parts of it uh, on the beginning in the Blätter für Geschichte in Yiddish, and that was already in 19... Um, let me see my notes. I think it was already in, in the 40s. Um, in 1948, in yes, for sure, in 48, And that was just part of, of his notes from the time 1941-1942. And then they managed to translate part of the uh, Ringelbrum notes from 1940 and publish it in Polish version of Blatefa Geschichte in Bulletin. Żydowskiego Instytutu Historycznego. And then they, they tried to make um, quite comprehensive uh, but also under censorship um, publication of the full notes. And again, the Yiddish version was on the beginning, uh, was the first one, and it was published uh, <clears throat> parts of it in uh, 1952. Uh, and the complete Yiddish version. Um, uh, was in 1956, I believe, and the Polish version was prepared to be published in the 60s, but due to the uh, anti-Semitic campaign of 1967 and 68, uh, it was stopped, and the Polish version was in the first full Polish version of Ringelblum archive, uh, Ringelblum notes, sorry, uh, wasn't published until 1983. So I don't know if that helped if, if uh, that's the answer for your question, like fully, maybe also Agnieszka and, and um, Kasia would uh, comment on that because they're also an expert in this area. Uh, no, my, my question uh, actually aimed at how many copies they printed uh, of oh. it. So Blätter für Geschichte, I, I imagine hey. that it's probably a couple of hundred, but the books they, they, they printed, do you have any idea? Was it thousands in the thousands or more in the hundreds? I would say it was in uh, in hundreds, but I I don't know it for sure now. I can check it and go later back to you. But at this point, I don't have the number in the head. Maybe maybe uh, Kasia Persson and Agnieszka Żukiewska would know that. I think the the Polish the last Polish edition was quite considerable. The ones before small, all of both of them. Um, I don't have but, it on my desk right now, so it's difficult for me to check, but it's, I think it's, it's possible to question. check it. It is a great question. And I think what we should also say is the issue of translation is important here into foreign languages in terms of how they are distributed. Because, of course, the, foreign, the first foreign translations are done from the already censored Yiddish translations. So in the way the censorship of the Yiddish translation is completely different than censorship of the Polish translation, is very quickly redistributed in the French and English editions. In case of the English one, it's still the only edition we have. It's really the Polish, Yiddish censored edition. Um, uh, and regarding your question on, uh, on Sopakova, this is actually a brilliant question in a way that completely deconstructs my perfect image of Sopakova's study <laughs> and exactly pinpoints all its weaknesses. Um, the weakness of, of her study is that, of course, like everybody, she also has uh, a particular uh, mission to accomplish. And her, um, she's not very, I don't know how to say it. Um, but okay, in her um, study, there's no man. The 17 women she spoke, speaks of in each of those cases, the husband, if there is a husband or some sort of partner, is, disappears. Either disappears or is very weak or uh, is not there. In all the 17 cases, 
uh, which are um, which she writes about uh, the woman becomes immediately the breadwinner of the family and the le le family leader, so to speak. Uh, she doesn't write an introduction that she's picking up specific 17 cases when there is no man. She shows it as the, as the typical experience of women in the ghetto. We know this isn't so. I mean, that would be wrong to assume it is. Uh, there is no man, and the cho as there is no man, there's almost no children. In a way, the children are there in the background. They are the reason why women do what they do. But they're not presented in those studies as, as you know, humans with agency in any way whatsoever. So... Uh, this is very much, I would say, a study of, of specific women's experience pushing everyone around to, uh, to the background. And that, we could say, I mean, yeah, that's probably its weakness in a way if we want to look at it as a study of, uh, of, uh, of a ghetto experience, an example of ghetto experience. But, um, yeah, but I think that should be said. Yeah, many thanks. So I, I want to ask the question probably to all, all the, uh, the speakers. Uh, the question would be about the, what you don't know and you would like to know. I mean, what, we, what exactly are research desiderata according to you and what are the most important questions you would pose now? So from your point of view, so the, from, from, from your three points of view, and uh, so, and one specific question to to uh, Agnieszka, and uh, uh, is about uh, so about how this life or get to experience really change the Jewish culture. I mean that you that you that you that for you the sources are among others the uh, the cultural artifacts. So was this culture in ghetto so? rather the political culture, I mean, with, with this, this, the reaction or response to the situation of, of war, situation of ghetto, or maybe just other way, namely, so that, that the culture was a form of escaping, so the, of escape, and, to, and we wanted to, or they wanted to preserve this culture they had before the war. I mean, but, but is, is there any, any, any change in it? So as regards the, the, the topic by Katarzyna Persson, so I, I, I very like this, this, uh, this kind of, of, of question about this anti-heroic resistance. And of course, so the, probably the, so I would say that, that, that the, this discussion about what resistance really is and what kind of, 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 uh, of also, some sort of escape or some sort of hidden hidden life, and uh, and the, the conversation about the how to survive is is, is a really important question, I think. A, and to, and maybe maybe one question also, or my remark to to this conversation between between Stefan and Justina. And uh, so, what about what about the German translations or? of parts of Ring and Blue Archive. So is there any availability of the sources for German public or not? Oh, uh, I was surprised uh, when I uh, studied uh, history of uh, Warsaw Ghetto, especially um, um, the history of uh, Ringelblum archives uh, uh, that uh, some of members of Onyx Shabbat were uh, involved in um, language war between uh, Polish speaking and Yiddish speaking uh, um, citizens of the Warsaw Ghetto and uh, the leader of this uh, of Yiddishist group was uh, Menachem Linder and Ringelblum. Uh, um, um, uh, it's um, uh, and there is a part of a history which is still unknown. Uh, we uh, we can't understand why they were so deep involved in this uh, ideological um, uh, fight. And uh, uh, and I think uh, the background of this fight, the struggle, the language struggle, was uh, um, 
uh, strictly uh, material <laughs> uh, because uh, it was a um, struggle uh, in name of uh, interests, uh, privileges, uh, um, the uh, Polish speaking group was uh, much more privileged because uh, of uh, their abilities, language abilities, uh, education. Uh, they were uh, strongly promote, um, connected with uh, Judenrat. Uh, and uh, Yiddish speaking people were uh, connected with uh, um, uh, social institutions uh, like uh, 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 self-help uh, institution uh, organization uh, con uh, conducted by uh, Ringelblum. Um, and it was surprising for me uh, to discover this, uh, this aspect of, uh, of a history and uh, I was surprised of uh, involvement, of Ringelblum's involvement in, in this um, aspect. And uh, referring to your question concerning uh, culture, um, culture in the Warsaw Ghetto was... Uh, um, developed uh, uh, because of uh, common reasons. Uh, first of all, to survive. It was very important to, to survive. Uh, there, there was a huge group of artists uh, of many kinds in the ghetto who uh, wanted to survive by making culture. It was possible, that's why they uh, um, were doing this, they were doing culture. And uh, the second reason was psychological one, uh, uh, give, uh, to give people uh, the place to, to, to possibility to uh, forget about the ghetto. Uh, about uh, being uh, imprisoned. Um, that's, that's why you, we can say that it was uh, somehow the kind of escaping from the ghetto, uh, although being in the ghetto. Um, and um, uh, what is surprising that, the, uh, that, that people still uh, um, take um, part, took part in in cultural life uh, after the, fir uh, the even after the first liquidation action, uh, but uh, the whole uh, cultural life uh, had uh, underground character, much more underground character. Uh, it was uh, developed uh, in private uh, houses, uh, uh, it was developed in shops. Um, it, it, we can't compare uh, uh, culture uh, um, creating uh, uh, till 1942 uh, till uh, cross action uh, and the culture with culture uh, created after uh, the the action. Maybe Justina, Justina, you have floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is a great question. What else we would like to know? What are the unanswered questions? Um, and I would say that um, I have, of course, um, kind of my favorite uh, people from the Warsaw Ghetto, if I can say like that. And I don't know what their faith was after the war or and also during, uh, during the war. So that there are plenty of particular questions. I would like to know how the uh, faith of particular people ended. But also <clears throat> there are some broader um, areas that we cannot answer fully, even though the Ringelblum archive is um, 
so much um, was so much uh, done with the um, thinking about showing the perspective of very different group of people. I would like to know more about faith of people who were settled to the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, we know what happened to them from the accounts of people who watched them, but not really uh, from the, your own perspective. And this is really um, uh, a big gap for me. Uh, I, am, I am also very much interested in, uh, in public and intimate spaces in the Warsaw Ghetto. And I would very much would like to know more about how the relationships uh, in the overcrowded flats look like. There are some information in on it, uh, some articles in the Gazeta Żydowska, some information in the accounts, in diaries. But still, I would like to know more um, from the very uh, practical point of view, I would like to know um, what was the source of paper uh, for the people because uh, it wasn't the situation that you go to the to the store and buy a um, um, you know a, a kind of a note that you can uh, write in later on. So um, also these kind of questions that are in my head at this point. point. If I can just add, the issue about paper is because I show people around the Ringelm exhibition very often and every single time someone asks about the paper and we just don't know. Um, so it's one of the, I have this black list of questions that I don't know answers to and I'm fairly certain someone will ask and that's the paper question is also one of them when they see the documents. And I'll just second what, what Justyna said. Uh, Ringelm archive is huge. They strive to show as complex experience possible but still, that's an experience of the ghetto community filtered through the eyes of a really pretty coherent group. They may be diverse, they may come from different backgrounds, they may have you know, different experiences, but nonetheless, they're still people who can spend time thinking whether they should speak Polish or Yiddish, which is a pretty privileged position to be in the ghetto. So um, I think, yes, no matter how much they try, they still are an outsider group in relation to a large, large part of the ghetto community. Um, and, and to the long list of, of men issues mentioned, I would like to add what I already mentioned. So the experience of, of people who are religious and unobservant in the ghetto, which is very, very strongly underrepresented on those 5,000 pages of documents in, uh, in the Ringel archive. Okay, so um, welcome back to the second part of our um, special event. Um, just as we introduced the first part, I hope it clicks well with you um, that we leave just um, a few minutes to Władysław Schlengel again and his perspective. Um, and um, in the first part, um, I mentioned a few very, very basic facts, stylized facts about his life. Um, it's also actually reflected here. Um, the school of trade in Warsaw is seen above in the middle and to the very left of yours is the young Schlangel um, sitting. But this poem stems from a much more mature Schlangel um, being surrounded in very dramatic circumstances. <clears throat> a talk with a child. Year 1942. Mother and the child, workshop block. The child has a lilac face. Mother's hair is white as milk. <clears throat> Tell me, mother, the little one asked. I don't have any idea what this word means, afar. Okay. Afar means beyond the mountains, whistle the forests and the rivers, railways, voyage in the sea, ships and limited spaces. But how to explain it to a child? who has never heard of any of those. He doesn't know what a mountain is, what a river is. Unlike his mother, unlike me, he has no images under his eyelids and in his hats. They don't know the world. So there's another unknown word. It sounds long ago. Long ago is an urban evening, shining lamps, neon lights, a silent, peaceful apartment, well-heated oven, everything delicious, perfectly well on top, cakes from Ziemiańska, dinner nearby the radio, reading the morning newspaper, evening in the Palladium cinema, a month near the sea, 
pictures from the excursion. But how explain to a child the past bright and glorious when nothing, he knows nothing? How to explain long ago? You see, my beloved child, old and sad in your youth, long ago means a long time ago, when they did not ration honey and food to us. End of the little fragment. And <clears throat> we will now move on with the second part and introduce a slight modification in our schedule. Um, we'll start with um, the presentation by um, Professor Stefan Lehnstedt. And since um, Professor Lehnstedt has also other obligatories this day, um, we will add on a micro Q&A session immediately following up, following up his lecture. And any, to anyone interested in the German-Polish relations, you, usually the formula of he doesn't need any introduction works perfectly well for Professor Lehnstedt. Um, historian, has lectured at LMU Munich, Berlin, London School of Economics, research associate at the German Historical Institute, Warsaw from 2010 and to 2016. And uh, Professor Lehnstedt, the floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation and uh, thanks also for the kind introduction. My topic for today is German post-war perceptions of Jewish resistance. And it's probably hardly surprising that Germans after 1945 initially paid less attention to Jewish resistance than to German resistance. In the end, the respective narratives of resistance are nationally dominated. That is the central relevance for social commemoration, and for that there is usually a modest amount of familial memorial. This perspective characterizes the European countries with the resistance of the Jewish population included to varying degrees in their own canons. The German case, however, has some distinctive features within academic historiography. Indeed, for decades, there was a sometimes sharp rejection of Jewish resistance there, both as an object of study and as a historical phenomenon. After the end of the war, however, tens of thousands of survivors lived in DP camps in occupied Germany, and it was them who published the first studies and eyewitness accounts of the Holocaust and of Jewish resistance. Of course, this was not aimed at an academic and especially not at a German audience, but here, former opponents of the Nazis had joined together in the Association of Persecutees of the Nazi regime, the Vereinigung der Verfolgten des NS-Regimes, VVN. Their motivation was the fight against fascism, and this included giving the former fighters, resistance fighters, a voice. And it was this association that produced the first publication on Jewish resistance, and it was Sylvia Lubetkin's account of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It was a small pamphlet on cheap paper, but the print run must have been several thousand, if not tens of thousand. So, in Germany, and uh, I have to tell you that this book was actually um, published uh, in 1947. Um, so, in Germany, Warsaw, the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943 was the beginning of any engagement with Jewish resistance. The symbolic significance of this publication it is high, and it certainly found some readers. But it did not establish a serious exploration of the subject, not least because the two German states developed differently and the VVN was soon considered to be infiltrated by communists, which discredited it in the West. In the German Democratic Republic, a Marxist-influenced historical science developed, which was given many topics. In Western Germany, on the other hand, there was likewise no interest in researching 
the National Socialist Policy of Extermination. Historical scholarship was limited primarily to politologically inspired studies of the failure of the Weimar Republic and the structural shaping of National Socialism in the pre-war period. By the, late in, by the 1960s at the latest, however, Stauffenberg and his assassination attempt from 20 July 1944 had become part of the national, the German commemorative canon. And in 1968, the German Resistance Memorial Center opened with a first very small exhibition in Berlin. But this initially focused exclusively on the coup from 1944 and only gradually adopted a broader and more inclusive definition of resistance. German Jews thus had no place there for a long time. Also because in the German, Jew, German view, they, the German Jews, did not form groups but were active either as individuals or in non-Jewish dominated associations, such as Communist Party or trade union resistance. In contrast to this widespread assessment, other points of view were rather marginal. If this happened, other points of view, uh, they sometimes came from the German Democratic Republic, and then culminated in a remarkable publication, actually in Western Germany, on German Jews and the resistance in 1984. But precisely not in a renowned academic series or one of the traditional historians' publishing houses, but in a rather unknown, with a rather unknown publisher. The authors of this volume were Helmut Eschwege, a German Jew born in Hanover in 1913. He had emigrated to Palestine in the 1930s, but returned to the German Democratic Republic after the war. As a convinced communist, he struggled with real existing socialism throughout his life. He had to endure multiple party expulsions, and although he had actually been a historian since 1952, he was unable to officially practice his profession for most of his life. His pioneering study, he thus published together with the West German historian Konrad Kuit, who had been teaching in Australia since 1976. The book is still a fundamental work today, but as you can see, it was not mainstream Western German historians who dealt with the topic. With their book, Eschwege and Quiet moved in an international field of research to which the concept of Amidah corresponded in Israel, but which above all had a counterpart in a meanwhile rather nuanced study of resistance in Germany. In particular, the notion of resistance, that is the German word of resistance, should be mentioned here. It can be best translated perhaps into English as resilience. Developed largely at the Munich Institute of Contemporary History, the team around Martin Borchardt, the term means something like an attitude of refusal in everyday life, such as not giving the Hitler salute, insisting on traditions of non-Nazi milieus, and so on. Despite this tradition, or rather because of this tradition, the book by Eschwege and Quiet was largely ignored for a long time. A positive review by Arnold Pauker, himself a German Jew, a resistance researcher and the director of the London-based Leo Beck Institute. In the key German journal Historische Zeitschrift, this review, although very positive, remained without consequences. German historians at the time were enthusiastic about researching everyday life under National Socialism, and the concept of resilience stemmed not, not least from large-scale projects on this subject. However, in these projects, efforts were made to access new sources and perspectives beyond the conventional tradition of mere 
state records, that is using mere state records. And this, of course, would have been a fundamental prerequisite for research into Jewish resistance as well, which by necessity could not document its own activities at the time. Well, we have the notable exception of the Ringelblum archive, obviously, but records would simply have been suicidal in the event of discovery. But German historians rejected the extensive Jewish memoir literature that emerged after 1945, though many memoirs were printed from the 1980s onwards, even with audience publishers like Fischer and under the editorship of Wolfgang Benz. But historians still made little use of them, just as they rejected oral history, oral testimony from survivors. It was precisely the view of the perpetrators that additionally reinforced the victimhood of the persecuted Jews. But this also meant that as, and I quote, objects of aggression and extermination, they were once again robbed of their given and quite active behavioral possibilities, of the ability to renounce, of the willingness to emerge from impositions and entanglements, and finally, of the will to revolt, end of quote. And this quote was a thoroughly self-critical assessment by Peter Steinbach, the longtime academic director of the German Resistance Memorial Center. The Germans also did not deal with Jewish resistance because it was not very spectacular in Germany. And it did not result in revolts lasting several weeks like the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. It did not result in mass escapes or assassinations, as was the case often in Eastern Europe. In view of these acts, and also in view of the totality of the Holocaust, even Jewish survivors in Germany had to regard their own acts of resistance as modest. Admittedly, some of them even spoke of the fact that there had actually been no Jewish resistance in Germany. So Jewish, German Jewish survivors spoke of the fact that there was no Jewish resistance in Germany. Instead, they spoke about the alleged Jewish passivity on the one hand and the impossibility of revolt in the face of the superiority of the perpetrators on the other hand. As long as moral legitimation and recognition were fed by victim status, the emphasis on active acts was problematic. Even more, how could the few resistance fighters be related to the millions who died? The answer to this question, beyond the actually problematic and ubiquitous concept of victimhood, is obvious. The resistance fighters, too, were, of course, victims of persecution, and the millions who died were by no means passive. This is also the argument of the most comprehensive German language account of Jewish resistance to date. And it's a book dating from 1994. Its author was the Holocaust survivor Arno Lustiger from Benjin, Poland who took a very inclusive approach. And I quote, every survivor is a witness to this resistance because if the Nazis had had their way, no Jew would have survived the war. End of quote. After the war, Lustiger had established himself in Frankfurt as a textile manufacturer and after retiring, became a self-taught scholar of Jewish history. His documentary study can be characterized as popular science, but it's absolutely respectable and very impressive in its comprehensive approach that includes all of Europe. However, Lustiger had entered a territory that academic historians were not willing to share. Their treatment of survivor scholars had always been exclusionary. They had defamed their approach and rejected the books they produced, even when researchers like Josef Wolf limited themselves to commenting on perpetrator sources. And this rejection now also hit Lustiger. 
In the 1990s, however, a change in the perception of the Holocaust began in Germany as elsewhere. Thanks not least to, a major, to major media events such as the US television series Holocaust from the 1980s or Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List from 1993, the genocide of the Jews now became a widely perceived public issue. One consequence of this was the widespread identification with the victims throughout Western Europe and the USA, which in Germany became possible not least because of a generational change. The equivalent in the realm of academia was what Tom Lawson calls the breakdown of grand narratives. After many years of research on national socialism and its crimes, overall interpretations of national socialism <coughs> lost their appeal. Instead, scholars increasingly looked at the micro level in Eastern Europe, where the mass murder of European Jews had had its geographical center. Perpetrator studies, which are widely perceived as an influential research phenomenon, turned out to be a specifically German development. Wolfgang Schaeffler, who as a postdoc had been one of the official German observers of the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, may be considered the father of this school, though we can discuss whether what he did was actually perpetrator studies or whether we shouldn't speak of something like a forensic turn, but that's um, the sideline here. In the following decades, Scheffler became the German luminary of the Holocaust and was active as a historical expert in countless trials on Nazi crimes. The Scheffler School was mainly frequented by men, and I'm uh, glad that my colleague Peter here, who is also one of the pupils of the Scheffler School, is here because now you can correct me if you see it otherwise. With this Scheffler school, mainly frequented by men, a gender bias can actually be observed in German Holocaust research. Those who were interested in perpetrators and the crimes were mainly male. Those who were interested in victims and their actions were mostly female. Significantly, the pioneering German study on Jewish actions did not come from the field of academic research, but from the feminist Ingrid Strobel. She published a book on Jewish women in resistance in Poland and Western Europe in the late 1990s. Based on extensive interviews, she was also concerned with female empowerment using the example of Jewish fighters, women Jewish fighters, obviously, while she was only peripherally interested in the racist persecution and the situation of her heroines. And so her definition of Jewish resistance hardly differed from what we heard in the beginning. Strobel differentiated between Jewish resistance and Jewish women and Jews in resistance outside Jewish groups. Academically minded scholars have long since left this unproductive division behind. According to Peter Steinbach, this is based on the insight that Jewish resistance, because of the totality of the extermination, cannot be grasped with conventional categories. And that in this sense, neither resistance nor amida is needed for explanation, because it's simply sui generis. Its peculiarity lies in the fact that it's so generally human and universal the striving for survival, the assertion of men and women in the face of total violence, but in principle can and should be thought beyond political goals. For this very reason, Jewish resistance does not need to be mysticized, which in turn has the advantage that it does not need to be demysticized either. Not least this, distinguishes Jewish resistance from other national resistance groups, and thus also from the German resistance, which was not exposed to the Holocaust. In short, Jewish resistance is special and remarkable, but due to circumstances created by Germans, not by Jews. 
In Germany, important studies on Jewish resistance or Jewish self-assertion in the ghettos have been published recently. And in the last year, even in the last years, even current Israeli or American books have been translated. And uh, I'm glad to announce that uh, very soon we will have uh, the translation of Hanka Grupinska's Ocetania Liste in German in our own Turo book series here. Unfortunately, we did not finish it for the anniversary, but I think maybe end of May, beginning of June, it's ready. So the topic of Jewish resistance is now in Germany academically fully accepted. Well, the Silent Heroes Memorial, which is a branch of the German Resistance Memorial Center, there's now even a place in Berlin prominently dedicated to the self-rescue of Jews. It's also dedicated to rescuers, but it's also the self-rescue of Jews. This exhibition with a pan-European focus and an accompanying book series organized by countries considers attempts to survive as Jewish resistance. From flight and hiding to uprisings and mass escapes from death camps. In view of the state goal of murdering Jews, this is not an absurd argumentation, but in Germany also the end of decades of ignorance. In Germany, the Holocaust was not a topic for a long time because it was associated with unpleasant questions about social, collective, and individual responsibility. Historians therefore dealt with their own versus the Jewish history, which was perceived as foreign, and isolated them from each other despite the obvious interdependencies. In the public, ignorance of a Jewish perspective on the Shoah led, on the one hand, to the idea that the Jews should have resisted even more than others, and on the other hand, to the idea that they had done too little. Both are exculpatory views in respect of the extensive German passivity or even approval of Nazi crimes and national socialism. Against the Holocaust in its totality, one could not have done anything oneself. But at least the Jews, those affected by it, should have tried. This is how you might summarize this. However, Jewish resistance more and more is being perceived in Germany. Especially historical scholarships has changed noticeably after long years of disinterest and rejection. Whereas, and that's an interesting point, the German resistance has hardly been researched at universities and institutes for quite some time. It's actually being neglected. And Holocaust scholarship in Germany for some years has turned eastwards. There is a tension also for the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and a major German television uh, broadcaster even wants to show the celebrations in Warsaw on Wednesday, and they will transmit it live. So I'm glad that I can end with a positive tone here. Thank you very much. So, um, just as announced, uh, we weigh in with a little Q&A session here. Any questions, any volunteers to begin with? Thank you. <laughs> I, I particularly liked your reference to the, the necessity of interdependence of the different um, resistance groups. And the, during the 80s, I, I read the book of Frederick Cherry about the rescue of Bulgarian Jewry, for example, in old Bulgaria during the Second World War. So um, there are parallel examples of the rescue of Danish Jewry. And it was a particularly particular interest in the, uh, in the study groups concerning civilian resistance. Uh, the 
scientist's paradigm, uh, alternative social defense, historical case studies. And um, during the 80s, I was observing and tried to contribute to uh, remember this uh, quite interesting aspect of uh, resistance, not just by particular individuals like Raoul Wallenberg, also uh, Oskar Schindler, but also by, by groups, citizens, uh, slowing down the Holocaust uh, um, murder attempt. That means um, the same uh, is particularly interesting in terms of uh, studying the resistance in the Warsaw ghetto uh, against the uh, Nazi occupation, the collaboration, uh, not just the aspect of Polish anti-Semitism, but uh, particularly the collaboration of individual citizens supporting uh, rescue attempts or supporting and uh, giving refuge to those who is, try to escape <coughs> the um, lethal uh, situation which was uh, organized by the German Nazis and their collaborators. That's the reason why I would like to ask you, if, is there any perspective in this you know, inter, inter, interdependence uh, research of uh, different groups of different faiths or religions different uh, ideologies, a uh, kind of uh, humanist approach to the resistance studies for the future uh, in the academic. Uh. Um, so I think um, the idea, the, um, the, 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 the um, pushing for an integrated history, this is something what Charles Friedlander really um, made an argument for with his uh, with his uh, opus magnum, uh, where he shows that um, you can't write the Holocaust just from a Jewish perspective or from a non-Jewish perspective or from a German perspective, because this it's all linked and you can't separate it uh, from one another. If you want, this is what the Nazis try to separate the Jews from all the others, but they're are all these interdependencies. And um, I would say this is, um, um, to do this on a micro level is what, what happens recently. And uh, you might, for instance, look at Agnieszka Wierzchowska's study on Tarnów, where she really looks at how this, this worked in a little town. And obviously, this is not a study on resistance, because resistance is one phenomenon among many others. And I think this is also important that we have to look at resistance but not, well, mysticize it. It's, it's not the one most outstanding thing that happened in a ghetto. No, it's one thing among many others. So we have to integrate it. Um, any other questions? Oh. <clears throat> I would have a question related to your remarks about, the, as far as I understood, the skeptical approach of German historiography towards or history in general, but also specifically towards accounts by survivors, so or accounts by survivors after the war. So could you could you could you tell us more? So what what is according to you? So the the uh, the reason why German historiography or the milieu of uh, of German historians reacted other way than or or maybe other way than than historians in other countries. I'm I'm not sure whether I mean they they did it perhaps more aggressively, but I wouldn't say that oral history is a major trend worldwide for researching the Holocaust. I mean, it's simply, this is something that starts in the 1990s. Um, but the re refusal of, um, of uh, oral history or survivors' accounts um, uh, is, has two reasons. One of the reasons is the traditional 19th century school of German history that um, focuses on um, administrative and um, governmental 
documents, which is, if you like, um, the only acceptable documents. But who produced these during the Holocaust? Well, obviously, only the Germans, right? So you only get the German perspective here. This is one thing. Um, and it's problematic as well, but it's, it explains it. And it's not, I mean, it's a, it's a historical tradition, right? The other thing is that these historians, most of these historians were at least unconsciously aware that if they accept oral history, they have to deal with their own subjectivity. They actually accepted oral history when it came from German experts, and they, they really appreciated and liked talk to German generals, to, to men like Werner Best, and they, they integrated it in their scholarship, but they considered them for, I mean, there's no real reason you might imagine why these guys might be objective, but they considered them to be objective. <laughs> and they integrated them. Um, and they told uh, the, the survivors, and there is a, a famous, um, there's a famous debate, they, they exchange letters, Martin Brochard for the Germans and uh, Charles Friedlander um, from, the, from the survivors, the Israeli perspective, and they exchanged letters, and more or less Brochard explained Friedlander that he can't be an objective historian of the Holocaust because he's a survivor. So he's personally affected which for sure is true that he was personally affected, but so what? Um, and the other thing is that Brochard, I mean, he's certainly not a perpetrator of the Holocaust, but um, he was a member of the Hitler Youth. He, in 1944 or so, became, um, actually joined the Nazi party. So, I mean, obviously, he was also personally affected by National Socialism. Um, and one might ask why he might be more objective than, than, than others. However, by rejecting the Jewish perspective, the survivor's perspective as, well, not kind of, not objective, not a, not a legal perspective, um, they had not to deal with their own personal Involvement. They could say, well, we, we don't deal with that at all. I mean, it's not their involvement, not our involvement. We're just doing it on the base, based on documents. So by excluding the, the, the survivors' perspectives, they, had not, they, they were able not to deal with their own personal involvement. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Lenschnitt. Um, <clears throat> and um, well, the next presentation and uh, lecture will be delivered by a sociologist expert on the history of the Solidarność movement, um, deputy director of the Berlin branch of the Paletsky Institute, and last but not least, one of my two bosses, Mateusz Falkowski. Please come to the front. Thank you, Patrick, for this kind um, words. Um, my paper will show a particular way of looking at the ghetto uprising through the lens of analytical tools of social movement sociology. Uh, social movement theories ask questions about why collective action occurs, why revolution break out or social movements emerge. Uh, of course, most of these analytical tools are directed at understanding collective action in quite other conditions, primarily in democratic countries, sometimes in authoritarian ones. And here we have the case of collective action under genocidal conditions, under extremely repressive conditions. And there's an interesting uh, text by Rachel Einwohner, so American sociologist dealing with uh, social movements, where I will chat and quote. And I will juxtapose her reasoning with the particular testimony not used by her, but written down by Mark Edelman in 1945. 
uh, an account of the Bund's participation in ghetto uprising. But maybe I start with the uh, with the explanation with a small remark to the to the to this picture at the slide. So this is the the cover by the of the book published in by the underground publishing outlet within the Solidarity Movement in the 80s, in 1983. This is CDN, uh, CDN Verlag, so CDN publishing outlet. outlet. So, and for the 14th anniversary of Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, it was the republishing of, of the book by mother Marek Edelman, Get to Fi The Ghetto Fights. And uh, I, have, I can also mention that, that one of the people involved in this publishing outlet was the uh, current director of the Polymuseum, Museum, Zygmunt Stempinski. And, uh, and it was, it was the, the, the part of the, uh, of the repertoire of the movement in the 80s to, to take such, a, such a, examples from history or using it as the part of the narrative. So this is the, uh, the second slide shows uh, fragments, parts of the, of the underground uh, paper Tygodnik Mazowsze. So the, on the uh, 21st of April 1983, with some account of this ceremony so, or the, with the, with the, uh, of the 40th anniversary of Warsaw Uprising. And uh, Marek Edelman was, uh, was not, allowed by the government, by the communist regime, to participate in this ceremony, but he published or he wrote a letter which was, uh, which was uh, read by Rob Roman Zeman, other activist of solidarity and, uh, and also of Jewish origins. So Roman Zeman uh, uh, wrote, uh, 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 read this letter by, uh, by Edelman, and Edelman uh, told, among others, but we gather here on the 40th anniversary of our effort to choose a different death than was intended by the perpetrators of the genocide, not if the boat head and closed eyes, but with our heads rise, eyes open with the will to live in freedom and dignity. And this framing of freedom and dignity is something which is very, uh, very often uh, record or used also, or some, in some cases also instrumentalized in this case by the Solidarity uh, Movement. And now I want to, to go back to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the mentioned text, to the mentioned paper by, by Rachel Einwohner. It was published in American Journal of Sociology at the beginning of this millennium. And she asks, so in this text, opportunity, honor, and action in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Uh, she asked the question about uh, the real fact that, uh, uh, that normally speaking, nor in normal situations, theories of social movement assume that collective action occurs when there's opening of the situation. So with some sort of liberalization, when some sort of, 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 of situation which is more favorable for action, for collective action. As where the most theorists see it as a response to the opening of the opportunity, of the opportunity structure. And what we have to do with the fact that the collective action in the Warsaw Ghetto emerged not in response to opportunity, but to lack of thereof. And her explanation, her explanation is that we have to do with some construction of the strong sense of honor among the ghetto fighters of different organizations, which was very important uh, uh, and the hopelessness of their situation helped to construct a motivational frame that equated resistance with honor and make collective resistance at all possible. So the, in technical terms, the framing processes, so this interpretation processes, mediated some structural conditions, structural conditions or repressions by the, by the Germans, to produce collective action in absence of opportunity. And genocide is, in this perspective, seen as a factor that can, in a way, mediate the effect of opportunity or threat on the emergence of collective action. 
And this is, this is something, some point when I want to, to go to, to this account by Mark Edelman. So the, uh, Mark Edelman is, uh, is for me an example of a leader and of a leader who does such a strategic framing. And he does it after the war, immediately after the war in 1945. This, is, this account is also for some, uh, some uh, sort of, of laudatio for Bund, laudatio for, uh, for, for his, his own network of fighters. And, uh, and this is that Marek Edelman is interpreting here the context, the reason why the uprising didn't occur before 1943, why the uprising happened in spring 1943, and included some certain some values and motivational frames of the ghetto Jewish community and of the Jewish combat organization fighters. Uh, okay, so th this is th this is this is the, the also quite complicated because uh, some commentators now observe that Edelman, for example, that didn't mention many other networks or groups, and but in fact. Here, I'm not looking at whether, for example, Edelman fairly distributed accents and merits between, for example, the Bund, the Jewish Combat Organization, and other organizations like the Jewish Military Union. I am interested in a certain perception of attitude, perception of the logic of event by the leader, and the cause of the action, so by one of the leaders of, uh, of, uh, uh, of this uprising. Edelman also makes a certain universalization of these values, and I will also show it how uh, uh, does it here. And uh, then, uh, so this is uh, the, 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 my raw translation from the Polish text of, uh, of this uh, 1945 report account by, by, by Edelman. But first, Edelman starts with the perception of the situation that uh, that there is uh, some cognitive problem in the ghetto, and the Warsaw ghetto didn't believe in, in the news about mass gassing and uh, more repressions by Germans towards Jews. And by as uh, uh, this example of gassing of Jews in Helmno, not Nerem, they couldn't believe all those, those clinging to life, that life could be taken from them in such a way. Only the organized youth, closely observing the gradual increase in German terror, considered this accident probable. So this is the, the, the two groups, the, Germ, the, the Jewish community in the ghetto, the society, which is not particularly smart so the, in, in this manner, so by, by Adam Edelman, or maybe not smart, but, but which, is, which doesn't want to believe. And there's some organized youth, this, this, this people who are very smart and very organized, and this organization is something which is resourced. And Marek Edelman tells us about lack of resources and resources. So they, for example, we form the first fighting organization. We start with theoretical training. The complete lack of weapons prevents us from expanding our activities. This is something which is very uh, much conceptualized and, uh, and elaborated by Edelman. So the different kinds of resources, so I mean that on one hand, the, the support or, or understanding on the part of, of, of the society in ghetto. On the other part, the material resources from the Aryan side, so the, for example, weapon, and on, on not uh, uh, yet other uh, side, there is the, the juxtaposition of, 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 of some official organizations like Judenrat vis-a-vis the, uh, the, 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 the Bund, the Zukunft, and, uh, and, uh, and this youth organizations. So, Mark Edelman observes lack of collective action. So the fear of the Germans and of the collective responsibility is so great that even in the best of people, in the best people, it's pos impossible to bring out a reflex of protest. And then the situation, uh, uh, 
slightly changed so in April 1942, so one year before the Warsaw Uprising. On that day, they suddenly felt that the ground was being removed from under their feet. Everyone understands when the ghetto will be liquidated, but no one realizes that the ghetto will go up to its death. Then, uh, so that we have the, some, some sort of, of, as I mentioned, so of, of uh, differentiation between Bund fighters vis-a-vis -vis the broader community in ghetto and vis-a-vis -vis official organizations like police or Judenrat. We, so meaning Bund, Zukunft, organized youth, take a position of active resistance. Unfortunately, the entire public opinion was against us. The general public regarded such a speech as a provocative, convinced that if the Jews peacefully delivered the required quota, the rest of the ghetto would remain in place. So, I mean, so the, 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 again, Edelman should, you know, interprets, frames this effort that, that some other sort of understanding among the fighters than in the, in, uh, the rest of the Jewish community in the ghetto. The situation in the summer of 1942, during the period of the liquidation action and transport to Treblinka, is described the following way. A small handful of us remain. We don't want, we do what we can, but we can do very little. We want to save what we can steal at all costs. We are slowly losing contact with almost everyone. Only one larger group of comrades remains, 20 people at the Stotkarze, Brushmakers on Franciszkańska Street. This is our most tragic period. We see that we are left without organization. Organization is something very important so in, for, for Edelman from this perspective. Autumn of 1942, the reconstitution of the organization with fighting groups divided into different parts of the ghetto. Together with other networks, in November, uh, a coordination committee is formed, and on December, the Jewish uh, combat organization is created. Jews are finally beginning to understand that displacement is death, that there's no other advice for us but to die with honor. Only that they still, as it's in human nature, prefer to delay this moment of perishing and honor as far as possible writes Edelman. Then we have, uh, we have this, this moment of, of newly organized resistance in the year 1943 during the second liquidation action. It's not important how many Germans fell under the shots of the job. What is important is the moment of mental breakthrough. What is important is that the Germans, due to the admittedly weak, but for them unexpected resistance, had to stop the action. So this moment of mental breakthrough, so this is described and is also attributed to the efforts by job fighters. Again, we have the description of resources, the the job introduces taxation of where to get the residents to purchase weapons, to buy weapons, and is able to raise 10 million water in three months, with which weapons and explosives are purchased on the other side of the wall, on the Aryan side of Warsaw. And then uh, Edelman mentions the, the, the meaning of victory uh, in his account. It's hard to talk about victory when you're fighting for your life and when you lose so many people. But one thing we can say about this battle, we didn't let the Germans carry out their plan. They didn't deport anyone alive. So this is, this is very characteristic for Edelman to phrase this, this way. And, uh, uh, and this account ends with, uh, with some mention of values and uh, with some uh, uh, mention of sacrifice and the meaning of the of the victory, yes? We were all fighters for one just cause, equal in the face of history and death. Every drop of blood shed had the same value. Those who fell fulfilled their task to the end, to the last drop of blood that soaked into the pavement of the Warsaw ghetto. So, the, in a way, the framing by Edelman 
the strategic framing framing of the leader of the of one of the leaders of uh, of uh, Jewish combat organization uh, is to die on their own terms. Don't, don't do do not allow Germans to realize their plans. And I finish with this sentence uh, 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 spoke by Edelman uh, in 1983 and, uh, and used by the Solidarność movement that the Warsaw Uprising was, according to this framing, according to this strategic framing, effort to choose a different death than was intended by the perpetrators of the genocide. And to have, uh, to have had rise, eyes open, and to, to be able to live one day, two days, three days, one month, or maybe more, in freedom and dignity. And this freedom in dignity and, and some sort of, of, of freedom to also for death is something which is, which is, which is characteristic for this, for this strategic framing. Uh, and I've, I think uh, this is something, this, this elaboration of what freedom means and what dignity means was very often, after the war, taken by different groups in Polish society and, uh, and so to say, reused, I mean, the, as in case of Solidarność movement in 1983. Many thanks. Thank you very much, and um, definitely I think we could see also how, what powerful and colorful a figure Marek Edelman was, so let me also just remind on that note that um, after this academic symposium, um, we'll also present, um, organize a movie screening um, of a film about Marek Edelman. And uh, now, um, yes, we'll um, go back to business as usual in terms of our schedule and um, have our last participant, um, Peter Klein, right now. Um, after that, there will be an additional Q&A session, of course, and um, Peter Klein is a historian. He has been teaching as professor of Holocaust research at Turo University Berlin since 2013. Thank you very much, and um, the floor is yours. So thank you for your invitation and um, thank you for the friendly words. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, we now want to completely change the perspective um, of what we had uh, today uh, because now we will take a deep look into the whole world of uh, legal questions regarding uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in the 1960s and 1970s. That means we change the perspectivity or the perspective um, to all the questions um, how state attorneys tried to, um, to uh, bring perpetrators to trial and the way how the judges react to all this. <clears throat> so, if one asks oneself how many times the violent suppression of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising by German soldiers, order police, officers, Waffen SS members, security police, and last but not least, auxiliar police officers borrowed from Travniki was tried before German criminal courts, one would be amazed. After all, it can be reconstructed. It concerned at least 26 German Wehrmacht, Waffen SS, and police officers with at least 1,520 men who were subordinate to the SS and police leader in the Warsaw district or were called in as support. It is difficult to estimate the number of those who were murdered in the embattled ghetto area itself. The number of persons mentioned by Jürgen Strobe, it is about 14,000 must be, I think, considered as um, realistic. In addition, 
Since the Nuremberg main war crimes trial, the so-called Strope Report had become internationally well known, and the main protagonist himself had testified before being extradited to Poland. One might therefore think that a chronological, well-defined sequence of murderous acts under a precise command structure a photo documentation as well as innumerable eyewitness reports should lead comparatively easily to further investigations. If one examine this expectation of German public prosecutors and criminal police in both German states, one realizes how unimportant a structured investigation for perpetrators had initially been. In Germany today, it is said that Kommissar Zufall investigated. You know, Kommissar Zufall is hard to explain in English. It is like a detective superintendent with the name, you know, by accident <laughs> or by chance. Yeah? Um, and this Kommissar Zufall reacted and acted for the starting time of both German uh, states. As for example, in Steffenshagen in Brandenburg, where a wife was initially supported by her daughter in bringing her husband to prison. They had both claimed that the father and husband, according to his own statements, had been present at the defeat of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943, had himself told of shots in the back, and had brought home looted property. This seemed to be sufficient for the indictment, but both women revoked their statements during the trial. Now it took revenge, it was bad luck, that no one had accurately determined the real police affiliation of the accused men. So the Grand Criminal Chamber of the Neuruppin District Court acquitted the accused police senior officer on September 20th in 1949 without making any further inquiries. You know, he was released. The German concentration camp inmate functionary Walter Warczynak, oh, Warczynak was indicted a year later at the Leip Leipzig District Court for, among other things, selecting fellow inmates who were no longer fit for work for deportation as a senior capo, capo in the Warsaw Ghetto concentration camp, and at the same time arranging for numerous murders as a double agent for the Gestapo. In addition, he was accused of having handed over hidden Jews to the security police during the cleanup operation of the ghetto, on the ghetto grounds. But this charge was not investigated further into because Wawjiniak's individual murders of prisoners and aiding and abetting deportation to Auschwitz were sufficient enough for sentencing him first to death but later than to life imprisonment. So from these files of this criminal court, we do not find any details about what this man did in his everyday's work as the chief senior capo of the concentration camp in Warsaw when he was said that he handed over uh, still hidden Jews to the um, security police and ST. In the 1960s, the first sentence of life imprisonment was handed down to a Waffen-SS Unterführer, so sergeant, for leading a so-called extermination squad. He set fire to houses in the ghetto and waited with the machine gun for Jews who wanted to escape from the burning house. The Erfurt Regional Court considered this to be proven, and when Hugo Milke applied for rehabilitation in 1993, he still has been in jail since 1960, you know, this appeal was rejected. The first major criminal trial in the Federal Republic of Germany for acts of violence in the Warsaw Ghetto took place before the regional court in Dortmund with a verdict in March 31st in 1945. The defendants 
were former 20 former policemen of the police battalion number 61. Today, the members of this battalion are accused of countless individual murders as schedule guards, as civilian patrols, and organizers of the deportations to the Warsaw ghetto uh, transfer point called Umschlagplatz. In 1953 and 54, however, the indictment was limited, limited to fairly precisely one datable shooting of 110 people in retaliation for attacks by Jews on individual German police officers. Although this retaliation action can be dated fairly and accurately from sources and witness testimony to July the 2nd in 1942, the court in the main trial shifted to playing off the differing dates of 20 persons against each other and later on stated that it was impossible to attribute this murder to the defendants. All the members accused here were acquitted. This verdict was a scandal, a real scandal. Yeah, it was for tactical reasons made by the judges, you know, to bring none of these police officers to jail, officers to jail. But it wasn't the only scandal. With the founding of the central office of the state justice administrations in Ludwigsburg in the wake of the Einsatzgruppen trial special commandos in Ulm, the West German judicial authorities for the first time confronted the manifold problems of investigating criminal offenses and suspects with a strategy of investigation. In Ludwigsburg, an authority was set up that conducted preliminary investigations and only after a certain level or a certain stage of the investigation had been reached did it hand over the material to the public prosecutor's office in, those in whose territory the main, the main suspect was located. In the case of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there was also a certain amount of public interest, I would say, in the Federal Republic of Western Germany. You know, Josef Wolf had presented, um, had presented uh, his book, uh, Das Dritte Reich und seine Vollstrecker, The Third Reich and its Enforcers, with the Strobe Report and confronted it with the material, selected material from the Ringeboom archive he had also for the first time publicly cut a swath through the seemingly inextricable change of command and overlapping responsibilities between the SS and police leader and the KDS and the BDS and the Gestapo officers and the Waffmesses and so on and so on. You know, he took the pathway for the first time through all that overlapping um, 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 responsibilities. And um, he introduced the actors. One got to know Jürgen Strobe. One learned about the Aktion Reinhardt with Globocznik and the staff leader Hermann Höfle. And one came into contact with the street, secret state police in Warsaw because Ludwig Hahn was described in this book as commander and Karl Brandt as the head of the Judenrat, uh, Judenreferat I'm sorry, and Josef Blöche as a minor crew rank, a rank and file member. The West German publishing house Luchterhand Verlag published the full report for the first time for a broad public. And last but not least, there was an exhibition in Frankfurt am Main in November and December 1963, which is completely forgotten today. The photo exhibition with the simple title Warsaw Ghetto was based on a project of the same name by the Holocaust survivor Alexander Bernfess, who had already shown it in London in 1961 and 1962. This exhibition toured only for a short time in Western Germany. However, it was nevertheless visited or attended by 61,000 persons. From later research, however, it is known now that the exhibition was also pushed by the German, West German Foreign Office and the Federal Press Office because it was feared that a second traveling 
exhibition on the ghetto by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw would be officially offered for the Federal Republic for installation. This exhibition came to West Germany too, but one had now the possibility to refer to the own previous exhibition and contribution for the open public. This small episode shows that the federal German foreign policy, which at that time had no diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of Poland, subordinates historical consciousness and awareness to the national interests during the period of the Cold War. Anyone who wants to research the Warsaw Ghetto crime scene today on the basis of the prosecutor's investigations cannot get past the Hamburg State Archives. After initially preliminary investigations by the central office in Ludwigsburg, the former commander of the security police and SD, Ludwig Hahn, who lived in Hamburg, was identified. He had become an insurgent agent here and was again using his original name. The whole procedure actually began with a single complaint in which Hahn was accused of having spoken quite openly about his individual shootings and this during private social gatherings. A journalist had contacted the public prosecutor's office in Hamburg. Between 1960 and 1965, the investigation results in Hamburg swelled to such a content or to such an extent that several partial complexes were created from the original proceedings. The first was a trial concerning the killings at the Paviak prison in Warsaw, which was under the control of Ludwig Hahn. Among the countless shootings of Poles and of Polish Jews that were committed here, one was accepted by the court in the main trial as having been fully investigated. And Hahn was sentenced for 12 years imprisonment for aiding and abetting murder in 150 cases. The shooting for, uh, of about 250 Jewish men, women and children who were still hoping for their recognition as foreign citizens in the Hotel Polski in the late summer of 1943 could not be proven against him. Strange enough, I would say. The same applies to the countless reprisal and individual shootings. The second complex of crimes that became Ludwig Hahn's fate was the planning and actual implementation of the deportation of Warsaw's Jews to the Treblinka extermination camp, so summer of 1942. Although this action was largely a joint effort of the SS and police leaders Eduard von Samen Frankenegg and Odilo Globocznik, Ludwig Hahn, together with his people from the Judenreferat and other members of his department, had to organize the sealing of the certain blocks of houses and the expulsion of the trapped people to the so-called transshipment point, or what the Germans called Umschlagplatz. He expressively covered up and approved of the countless abuses and shootings of his subordinates during the week-long actions between July and beginning of September of 1942, whereby the names of Karl Georg Brandt, Josef Blösche, and Heinrich Klaustermeier were repeatedly mentioned as the perpetrators. There are a lot of survivors' accounts regarding these three peoples. Karl Georg Brandt had been shot in February 1945 while defending Poznan from the advancing um, Red Army. Josef Blöschig was, Blöschi was um, living in the GDR, a fact that the Hamburg Public Prosecutor's Office officially communicated to the authorities there in 1966. Heinrich Klaustermeier, on the other hand, had already been identified in Bielefeld in 1961 and was included into the Hamburg proceedings. When his individual acts under investigation became too extensive, Hamburg transferred the proceedings to Bielefeld, where he was sentenced to life imprisonment in February the 4th in 1965. 
Josef Blöcher, as you perhaps know, was arrested in the GDR in January of 1967 and remanded in custody. He admitted his involvement in the murders, both in the summer of 1942 and uh, in the Strobe Aktion in April of 1943. So Dr. Ludwig Hahn was also sentenced for this, to life imprisonment on July the 4th in 1975. But the two sentences, the one 12 year for the murders in Paviak and the one's life imprisonment for aiding and abetting the murder at least to 230,000 Jews during the summer of 1942, then ensured that Ludwig Hahn was not even charged for his participation in the suppression of the ghetto uprising. This respect, uh, uh, request came from the prosecutor itself and was accepted by the district court in January of 1976. Actually, a comprehensive investigation of the contributions to the crime, not only by Hahn, but also by 15 other defendants had been prepared there. So that for the first time in Western Germany, the security police, the Waffen-SS men, and the order police from the police battalions could have been charged. In total, the crime investigators in Hamburg reconstructed 99 names and fates, as well as an unknown number of members of the 6th Company of the Infantry Replacement Regiment 603 of the Wehrmacht, which was very new at this time. And as unsatisfactory as the end of this investigation regarding the Strop Aktion is, historically, these investigative files are indispensable for a more accurate historiography of the resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto and its brutal suppression by the Germans. And this material is still located in Hamburg and I think mean, in the meantime accessible via the internet. Let's go on with the, the, the um, Warsaw Uprising. A second great opportunity for the prosecution of murderous acts in the course of the Strobe Aktion aroused with the indictment of Karl Streibel. For the battalion of Travniki units that Strobe used had been cleared for this purpose, purpose by the head of the SS training camp for foreign ethnic units. The use of Travnikis in ghetto evacuations in the Lublin district was cleared in so far as one could prove the involvement of these units 16 times in 101 extermination evacuations in the district. In the Strobe report, Travnikis were even recorded in the photos. There was an abundance of witness testimony and survivor accounts so that the main trial would be extensive, but seemed certain in the course of a conviction for Streibel and five other defendants for assistance to murder. But exactly the opposite occurred. On the charge of having been actively involved with his men in the suppression of the uprising, the court found now that the suppression of the uprising and the deportation of the remaining survivors to Treblinka was objectively, objectively an assistance to murder. But, and I quote, the defendant Streibel, however, according to the findings made, probably did not seriously expect or even know when he sent the guards to Warsaw for the reasons explained in detail above that the people were to be killed in the action. Rather, he probably expected a peaceful transfer of a much smaller number of Jews to labor camps. He therefore probably lacked the intent to aid and abet murder since this intent has thus not been proven to him, he was to be acquitted on factual grounds. Bah. This applied, oh, applied to the other five persons too. 
this was really an extraordinary, you know, juristical or legal failure, considering that Stribal's people were, after all, constantly on duty in the annihilation camps of Belsic, Sobibor, and Treblinka. But there too, he could relay or rely on the on the um, the judges in Hamburg. The court believed his statements that he had released the troops for the service to the camps only once, and that was only for the construction for the camps and not for the running for the camps. So expressively not for the participation in mass murder. Of course he would have learned about this only in the course of the time through rumors. His objective aiding and abetting took place without intent. The 16 acts of participation in violent ghetto liquidations in the Lublin district and in Lublin itself were also questioned by the court and it was stated that not all of the participant could, uh, participations could be proven. This verdict of the Hamburg legal code in June, of June 3rd in 1976 was then confirmed by the Federal Supreme Court in October 9th, three years later in 1979. Only once did the materials so laboriously compiled for a conviction for the stroke action held in Hamburg, which had not been applied in the case of Hahn and 15 others. And this was the case against Georg Michalsen, who was constantly on the road on behalf of Globochnik's plan ahead for ghetto liquidations. And for this, he received 12 years imprisonment, five of which he served in prison. In the GDR, after the death sentence against Blöcher, convictions were only to be expected when it was mainly against the police battalion members of the battalion number 304. These indictments were based on the findings that the GDR had compared together with the Polish investigation authorities. Crimes committed during the guarding of the ghettos in 1941 were always at the center of attention. Between 1975 and 1981, seven defendants were sentenced to prison, terms ranging from, well, 30 years, 13 years to life imprisonment. So, success and unsuccess is the coalition when you look deep into the questions regarding the Warsaw uprising, the Warsaw ghetto uprising um, <coughs> in West German courts. However, despite the non-indictment of the Strop action in the case of Ludwig Hahn and the acquittals of the Streibel trial, a development occurred that should not go unmentioned. In the spring of 1966, a 31-year-old prosecutor in Hamburg began investigating the commandant of the Travniki camp and later prosecuted the case. The blatant miscarriage of justice induced her to devote herself entirely to the subsequent investigations of violent German crimes in Poland. As the only female prosecutor at the Hamburg Regional Court, she was for her for the time of her complete profession, she was responsible for the investigations and indictments at the Ghetto Radom, at the Ghetto Savierce, um, as crime scenes. She cleared up the death in the Wuch camp where Polish youth were imprisoned and murdered. She conducted proceedings in the case of the Einsatzgruppen, the Salas Pils and the Kaiserwald camps in occupied Latvia, and she investigated the Gestapo offices in Lyon, Orléans, and Marseille. Helge Grabitz, Helge Grabitz and the historical expert Wolfgang Scheffler, who was involved in the Streibel trial, perceived the acquittal at that time as a legal blessing of forgetting what happened in Warsaw and in the Lublin district. For this reason, both published three books and curated an exhibition in which one can still learn about the historical circumstances and the criminal proceedings. 
the seminars offered at the Free University and the Technical University during the 1980s laid the foundation for the fact that since the 1990s, there should be or there could be anything at all like a so-called German Holocaust research. Thank you. So, um, yes, who would like to ask a question to any of our contributors? Very, very brief question uh, referring to the collaboration of um, uh, German researchers and international researchers to enlighten the background and uh, contribute to the persecution of the perpetrators. So this is after, let me say, Raoul Hilberg. And, uh, just want to know, is there any um, uh, history of that um, collaboration of um, international science? Yeah, okay. So. So West German historical experts as expert witnesses in, um, in um, judicial trials um, had, I think, some international cooperations. So it is well known that Wolfgang Scheffler and Raoul Hilberg cooperated together. It is well known that he cooperated with um, Henry Friedländer and his wife, Sybil Milton. And we know that in the first time, so in the late 60s, um, Scheffler cooperated with Shlomo Aronson in, um, in uh, Tel Aviv. Or Jerusalem, Tel Aviv? Oh, I, I forgot now. You know, but Shlomo Ar Ar Aronson, you know, had, had uh, written um, the, first, the first dissertation or PhD work on the uh, early history of the so-called security um, service, so the SD, and therefore had a lot of good contacts and a, 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 very, a very precise overview about the different um, individual careers of young Gestapo and SD officers on their way you know, to that uh, leading positions in occupied Poland, like uh, KDS persons, uh, so commander of the security and police, so you know, comparable um, to, to, um, to the heads of the Gestapo of the regional and local Gestapo. Though, of course, there had been contacts and there had been cooperation. And in some cases, even with the GDR experts, you know, there have been, um, there have been I would say, informal contacts between um, persons like um, um, Helmut Eschwege um, with uh, Wolfgang Scheffler or Mr. Wieland from uh, um, the, the East Berlin-based um, general, general Prosecutor's Office of the GDR. Um, but um, this was always, you know, under a certain, or based on a private level, uh, which should not become a political thing. So this was the, I would say, yeah, it, there was a clandestine network into the direction of the East. <laughs> And, and an official, more official into the direction of the West. And one, one small uh, question referring to the exhibition you mentioned, which was quite interesting. Uh, what would you say is the most comprehensive and uh, in-depth exhibition referring to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising since then? In German? In Germany? In German English, <laughs> I say so. Yeah. Well. English language, if you know. Well, I would say that the next very good and very expressive documentation of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is, I think, in Poland, in the Polin Museum, and in Yad Vashem. That means, you know, we still have a lack in those things. Thank you. Maybe Thank you. Maybe 
Maybe I compliment the, this information. So uh, our colleague uh, Katarzyna Persson of the Jewish Historical Institute, uh, who is unfortunately already left, but uh, but uh, but she she will curate uh, an exhibition which will be shown uh, uh, in München in uh, June. So this is temporary exhibition. So I'm not sure what is the exact focus of this exhibition, but it should be about the life in the ghetto, also about the pricing, and we hope that. And I can I can also give to. The the in the sheet itself, there has been a there has been a, an exhibition, um, as far as I know, uh, you know. Oh, when did I see it? in the 80s and 90s? I'm sure that there was an exhibition, you know, in the entrance in the stair, in, in, in the stairway, um, on the on the um, on the Warsaw ghetto. But it was a complete, so a complete overview, not focused on on the uh, on the um, uprising. Okay. Um, in, in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, yes. in its main building. So we unfortunately didn't manage to prepare exhibition ourselves in this space, but we planned such an exhibition for the anniversary, but unfortunately for financial reasons there was not possible this year, but this exhibition, also in cooperation with Jewish Historical Institute, will be shown here next year for the, the 8 and 1 anniversary. Yes, my question is, in terms of when you talk about the perpetrators, in terms of the Warsaw Ghetto, there were different organizations, the SS, the police, and so on. So when it came to the trial, did these organizations not try to play each other off in terms of saying those are more responsible than yes. the other ones, yes. or was there cooperation among those groups at the trial? Uh -huh. Um, this is very interesting to see. If, if you take a look into that files that have been never been used for a main for a main trial, you know, against all these members, you know, although the preparations had been made and were ready, if you take a look into that material, you can see that um, police officers and Waffen SS officers sometimes want to shift their precise, you know, their their precise orders. Uh, based on a higher level order from the colleague, which is to be interrogated, you know, the next day, something like that. You know, of course, there have been such tactical things, but in the end, um, based together with the um, with the contemporary um, um, documentation in the Strop report itself, you can reconstruct the real re responsibilities. So, of course, it was a tactical thing, you know, but in the end, it was possible, uh, you know, to precisely define who was responsible for what. I, I have a question to Mateusz. Um, you were talking about uh, the framing that um, Marek Edelman gave to the history of uh, the Warsaw Uprising. Framing usually, the term is usually used in a, in a critical way. So my question is, would you think uh, that there could be other uh, framings of the events? Uh, or um, isn't it just the only possible uh, framing that Marek Ehrmann gave? I would say, I would answer this question, thank you. Uh, with such an answer that, that uh, this framing uh, is not only on the level of leaders of the uprising, but also, also uh, among the, the, the every population uh, related. And of course, in this particular case, we have the problem that we, we don't have enough documentation, so enough documents or enough survivors to ask them about it. One of the examples of such a controversy now is the history of, uh, of uh, Jewish military union. So this was the other group, other military group uh, of active in the ghetto. And, uh, and the, the controversy is 
that the um, report or account by Edelman and uh, um, Jewish combat organization dominated the field after the war. I mean, their perception, their framing of the events w was this, this probably the only one. And now uh, this is one thing. Another one is, of course, and another aspect of, of this history of, of uh, presented in the way uh, by Edelman is that he focuses on, on military uh, resistance, uh, giving it the very spe specific meaning, actually the only way, possible way of resistance. And as we already uh, listened to the presentation uh, before the break, so there are different, or to the, to the taxonomy presented by, by Stefan Lenstedt. So there are many possible resistances and we can think, for example, also from sociological point of view, there is, for example, the book by James Scott, so quite famous book about the uh, uh, domination and the art of resistance, about the peasants in Indonesia, and that, or about the, the, the conceptualization of resistance, that, for example, in the US, uh, there was the, so all the slaves who made jokes in the kitchen resisted in a way, or they sung the songs. And there was also kind of resistance. And we can perceive the cultural uh, life in the ghetto, we can, from this perspective, uh, recognize or frame as a form of resistance. Marek Edelman focused on this military form of resistance and they give the strong meaning of it and, uh, uh, and limited this effort to the, to, the, to the particular group of Bund and uh, his particular group. And this is, of course, uh, in a way controversial, but uh, as I've said at the beginning, so the, we have the problem that, that, uh, that for example, from the, from the uh, uh, Jewish military union, so uh, most people, uh, unfortunately, didn't survive the war and uh, and uh, this is this is the, the the problem of course we have in this in this uh, discussion about what people how people interpreted this efforts how people interpreted the lack of uprising for example in uh, or lack of military efforts in 1942 and the the the, the reasoning behind the outbreak of the of the of the of the uprising in April 1943. Uh, I only I would like only to share my impression with you with Mateusz Falkowski concerning after war times. Uh, when many organizations, parties, Jewish parties, would uh, took part in discussion in Poland about uh, uh, involvement uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, uh, and uh, every party was sure that uh, their involvement, uh, the involve involvement of the member was the biggest one. And uh, the same problem uh, have had uh, Bernard Mark, uh, the first historian of the uh, Warsaw Ghetto up Uprising. As you probably know, he survived in Soviet Union. And he wrote the first book about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Mm -hmm. He wrote, um, it, no, it wasn't a book, it's, it was something smaller than book, but he uh, wrote it and published it in Moscow in 1944. And he uh, tried, uh, was try, trying to prove that uh, Jewish communists was the most active fighters um, in the Warsaw uh, Ghetto Uprising. And then, after uh, coming back to Poland, he published uh, uh, next version of uh, his book and uh, two more versions and every time he changed 
uh, some parts of uh, his book. Uh, it's a huge problem with dealing with such uh, uh, tragic and uh, uh, tragic history. You know, uh, I think uh, every fighter who survived uh, had the same problem, uh, like uh, Mark Edelman. Many thanks for this remark. So, the, the, as I said, uh, uh, this is important uh, now. So, because we now, so we we quite often we discuss what to do when uh, there are no um, survivors anymore. I mean, but in 21st century, I think I think the the this is this is uh, as we see from this discussion. Uh, from the presentations of our colleagues uh, from Jewish historical institutes, from our discussion, so we see that that there are some uh, there are many many questions not answered, many uh, uh, many challenges, for example, related to the uh, to the uh, to the elaboration or documentation, for example, regarding the Ringenblum uh, archive. And uh, and maybe maybe we can uh, we can also so uh, with historians or um, people discussing this this archive or also accounts given in oral history accounts, so we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, uh, we can preserve this memory or we can uh, find uh, another interpretations, but uh, but I would say. Also, that that from this history is uh, uh, this history is so important that, uh, so to say, naturally, it constitutes also some sort of additional addition to the pictures of of other uh, other fields of research. For example, the presentation by Peter uh, can be also used by the historians of. Polish-German relations after the war. What happened in the in the times of Cold War, and how uh, the the relations between West Germany and uh, Communist Poland uh, looked like before the formal formal relationship between the two states. I can add that, for example, so some weeks ago we had uh, here in this room uh, Philip Gainczak, who wrote uh, who wrote a book about Jan Zen and his. Among other things, his cooperation with uh, uh, with uh, Bauer, and uh, and this is another point of, of 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 to be discussed. And I think that this uh, this remark, this slide with this exhibition, so the, that, that this exhibition of uh, of uh, from Warsaw, so it's some also some uh, some uh, uh, interesting brick, interesting part to be to be taken by us. To be discussed, and uh, and uh, and I think uh, I think if we we have this big issue, big uh, big event, also tragic event, so the ghetto was, but also very uh, important for our for our values, for our for our um, actual discussion too. But aside, we also have some some many 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 other uh, issues and uh, documents. And this is, for example, interesting, and this is probably my question to Peter, uh, what, what is to be found yet? So, for example, as, re, as regards this, uh, this uh, post-war trials, and do, do you expect, for example, when in our hive of Stasi, so is this something which can be used, or, or do you think this story you presented from on, 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 uh, on the basis of Hamburg archives is complete, or so what do you think? So, in, 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 in questions of, um, of um, you know, investigations, investigations in what happened in history, I think, you know, this is, this is the status quo we have now, is uh, what we can reconstruct, and I think that's it. Um, what is purely not so very well known and still to be investigated is all these questions relating um, the three, the three part height, um, um, cooperations and, and relations between West Germany, East Germany, and Poland regarding all questions of, um, 
of um, um, planning and, um, and preparing for legal courts. Because, you know, in the, in the relationship down or below, below the official diplomatic relationship, you see a lot of, a lot of communication lines on a private or on a more informal sector. And it is very interesting to see that, so, you know, the Stasi wants the Plöche, the Plöche court, you know, to serve as a public evidence that the GDR is faster and more rigorous against um, a defendant with the official help of the Polish um, people's, uh, the Polish People's Republic. As the Western side did not have any contact to the Polish side, you know, they always used it as a propaganda. You know, they said, well, if you are not really interested in, you know, investigating, you know, then you will have this result and that result and th this result, you know. But if you would have a good contact with the Polish colleagues in Warsaw, then your trials would be better. And what, what came out of all of this was that the, the, the state prosecutors of Hamburg, you know, tried to establish a direct contact with the Polish partners. And the Polish said, yeah, of course you can come. And of course you can have all that material and all these copies, you know. And for a short, short period of time, you know, there was a real good and precise collaboration or cooperation between the both sides, you know. And the Stasi was, hmm, you know, um, beleidigt. Felt offended? <laughs> you know, yeah, felt offended about that, you know. So uh, if, you go, if you go in all these materials, you see that there, there, there is still an unwritten history um, of these informal contacts between prosecutors, historians, in the period of the Cold War, um, between the time, you know, before official relationship and after uh, official relationship, yeah. And um, you mentioned Jan Zin. Jan Zin. Yeah, Jan Zin. It, it, he's a perfect uh, uh, example, you know. Um, I was a young student when I attended a, um, an anniversary conference at the, um, at the uh, Ludwigsburg um, Zentrale Stelle and this central, central authority, you know, they, um, um, they did a, you know, a, sort of an anniversary celebration, you know? And uh, we were invited as very young students from Wolfgang Scheffler. And we sat there and I was, I think, 24 or 25, yeah? And then the door opened and a person came in who was not even expected. And that's Jan Sehn, you know? He got his, he, he had no problems to come, especially to this, to this celebration, you know? On the next day he was again, like, it was like he, he showed up like a ghost, yeah, and then he, he went away again. And these contacts, these sort of contacts are very, very interesting to explore. Yeah. Any other questions? Just a quick question. Uh, did the uh, ghetto uprising play any part in uh, communist Poland? Was it in any way commemorated in communist Poland? Because as far as I know, the communist government was not very interested in the Jewish question. The, the answer is, as always, complicated, uh, uh, of course. So we have, uh, we, we have, generally speaking, different possible categorizations of the fighters of, of the uprisings and communists also had some some categorizations and uh, they for example preferred to uh, to uh, to commemorate Jewish fighters communists also yes and this is there, there was there were some some communist uh, fighters in the ghetto or general communist fighters so for example in uh, one of the streets uh, uh, in Warsaw is uh, 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 of the name of Lewartowski. Lewartowski was, was one of these communist uh, uh, Jews. 
and uh, and this is this was it was one one uh, one example. Uh, another one was uh, was this ceremony uh, I described uh, uh, very shortly in uh, at the beginning of my uh, presentation. This was ceremony of the 40th anniversary, and it was it was uh, yes, and but it was it was this ceremony was organized by communists. So the because they were regime there was uh, just after the um, um, introduction of 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 martial law so during the the repressions in Poland and uh, and uh, general Jaruzelski so the uh, at that time the uh, the the most important person in the party and uh, in the uh, in the communist regime wanted to gain some legitimacy so because for example the communists invited at that time delegation from israel delegations from the world from america so in order to so because th there was some sort of ostracism against communism after introduction of martial law in 1981 and uh, and they wanted to, to 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 gain from this anniversary some 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 sort of legitimacy of course but but this is it was also uh, after just after the war, it was it was also uh, in that sense complicated that communists uh, uh, it was more uh, it was easier for communists to uh, to accept commemoration of ghetto uprising than the commemoration of Warsaw uprising. So they wanted to okay they agree to give some legitimacy or some commemoration for uh, Jewish resistance, but they didn't want to give this sort of commemoration or legitimacy to the home army, to Armia Krajowa and insurgents of 1944. And it was so in, in such vis-a-vis, -vis, so such situation, so you can see how, uh, uh, how uh, communists did proceed so with this with this tricky thing of, of ho what to commemorate, what to remember, and what not. So it was not clear that they, they hated Jewish, uh, Jewish fighters or they wanted them to, to be uh, 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 as heroes, yes? There was this memorial after all where the was kneeling upon. Yeah. That's there was this right. memorial after all. Uh, when was this? Uh, Established, by the way, the memorial for the Warsaw uh, uprising that Willy Brandt kneeled before. Very early, 1947, right? Yes, uh, so 47. Yeah, for, for yes, 1947. Uh, my question, question is actually about Willy Brandt, which. Um, the visit now, I think, almost overshadows the memory of the uprising in Germany. I think it's uh, interesting that it's often, in a few days, we're going to see that image again, and not <laughs> really images of maybe the uprising, uh, which is interesting because it's about German-Polish relationships and not about Jews, really. Um, it's seen as a moment of reconciliation between Germany and Poland, of course. And my question is, how did the uh, did Willy Brandt's visit change anything about the um, strategies of prosecutors in, in Germany, did it, can you see any impact it had on the willingness to prosecute or did it have any sort of meaningful impact outside of German-Polish relationships? So I, I, I don't think there has been any, any, um, any um, uh, common communique um, regarding um, a deeper cooperation between, um, you know, the, the the main state archive or the main historical archive um, of Poland with uh, the Bundesarchiv or something like that, regarding the possibilities, you know, to better prepare for for um, legal prosecution. I don't think that there has been that there has been a direct um, a direct influence into what in West Germany um, happened before legal, or in front of legal courts. I don't think so. I don't think so. Perhaps it was a better, or it was more easy, but 
I can only guess it, um, that um, German legal um, 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 committees um, it, yeah, consisting of the judge and the defendants and the, the attorneys and so on had a more easy uh, possibility to visit the crime sites in Poland. But it must, I, sh I, I, I would have to prove it. I don't know it exactly. No. I would recommend, so I'm not an expert on this issue, but, but I would recommend this book by Philipp Geinschak. This is by Wallstein Verlag, so now published. And, uh, and this is, in this book, there is, for example, the, 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 the very detailed description of the, of the visit of, of, of German, with German prosecutors in, in, in Auschwitz, so in Auschwitz, yes? And this is, this is one of exam examples. Okay, um, unless there is one last short question, I guess we are, coming, we are coming to an end towards the first part of our special event marking the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And um, thanks a lot, first of all, to all our contributors and um, lecturers today. Thanks um, for all of you for attending.